Hey guys, welcome to part 3 of what if Sage Naruto joined Akatsuki, if you enjoy the video then like, share and subscribe and also comment your thoughts as it inspires me to make more such videos and remember to check out my playlist section for other interesting stories. So let's get started. Chapter 11. Godam need to hit. How do you know this kind of shit? Language, Hidan. Kakuzu wasn't usually one for jokes, but the big payday in his immediate future was enough to lift even his spirits. Sasori and Zetsu still had to find their target, it wasn't you and me, and I doubt even Naruto and Didera are ambitious enough to go for two-tailed beasts in a row. Or at least not skilled enough to succeed in the attempt. That left Itachi and Kisame as the logical choice. I'll take my, large sum of cash, after the ceiling. You guys made another bet. I'm almost afraid to guess who Hidan picked, mumbled Naruto. I put my faith in you two pansies, and you let me down. Do you know how much I owe Kakuzu now? A large sum of cash. That's a large sum, shouted the silver-haired immortal, though his pink eyes were the only discernible feature through the projection technique. Hidan's loud ranting was almost enough to drown out the pained groans of the dying man in front of them, but Roshi's pain had practically become background noise at this point. A large sum of cash? Asked Hidera. One could almost see the eyebrow being raised. Did you even bother to count this, large sum, of money? Yeah of course I did. It was just more than I could count though. He then trailed off before defending his monetary prowess as loudly as he could. It was more than 20 though. I ran out of fingers and toes. Wow that is a lot. Replied Zetsu earnestly. You're both morons. Say, how would you deal with an opponent hiding in the bottom of a lake? Zetsu's white side decided to change the topic towards something hopefully beneficial. You found the three tails. Any snarky responses were stopped dead in their tracks by the voice of pain. Why yes, but the dumb turtle is at the bottom of a lake, we can't reach it, stammered Zetsu. Overwatering is nasty way to go. Poison won't work on the beast, and my selection of submersible puppets is limited, added Sasori. I see said Payne, shocking the other eight members of Akatsuki. Conan never seemed surprised by Payne and the others were generally unflappable, but Akatsuki's leader had only ever responded to failure with annoyance or anger. Zetsu. Use, that, technique to remove the obstruction to Akatsuki's goals. Are you sure? A look from the ringed eyes of God answered his question. Understood. What technique are you talking about? Are you keeping secrets from me? From M.E.? The others ignored Zetsu who continued to argue with himself for the rest of the ceiling. Roshi collapsed to the floor, and Akatsuki dismissed themselves after making sure that their leader had nothing more to say. xxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxx
Kakuzu's reply was short and economical, answering the question perfectly and leaving no room for a follow-up. Kakuzu, are we there yet? Apparently Hidan was too idiotic to realize that Kakuzu had already answered his question. Either that or he didn't care, which was more likely. No. Now would you kindly shut up for the remainder of our trip? I'd prefer to gather M thoughts before facing a demon in her own home, snapped Kakuzu after being forced to answer the same moronic question for the 500th time. He was still furious at Hidan for the 30 Rio payday he had gotten from their little wager. Kakuzu supposed he should be grateful to have money of any value, but his hopes had been raised by his partner. It was a mistake he wouldn't repeat in the future. Oh, so the Jinchuriki's a girl, huh? Said Hidan, taking Kakuzu's extra comments and running with them. Been a while since I killed a bitch. Like, what? Two weeks. Three. Eighteen days. And we aren't killing the Jinchuriki. Unless you want to face leader's wrath by yourself. Replied Kakuzu, resigning himself to petty conversation with an idiot. I wouldn't be alone. Objected Hidan. You're my partner, right? You wouldn't heartlessly stand by while I was being attacked, would you? Hidan leaned into Kakuzu's shoulder wearing a wide grin. You're right, I wouldn't stand by. Hidan stood up and looked at Kakuzu strangely. He joked around, but he had though Kakuzu didn't care at all. The fact that he would stand up for Hidan really surprised the Jashinist. I'd buy as stupid as you if I didn't join leader. Glad for his immortality, Hidan broke into laughter. There's the Kakuzu I know. I thought you were getting soft for a second there. Wiping a tear from his eye, Hidan decided for the annoying coup de grace. Anyway, Kakuzu, are we there yet? Yes, you idiot. Kakuzu's outburst was accompanied by explosive action. He turned around, grabbed Hidan's head, and threw him through the doors of a large building Hidan hadn't noticed in one fluid motion. Kakuzu calmly walked through the debris like nothing had happened as Hidan got up and dusted himself off. Man, you can be a real ass sometimes, you know that. Grumbled Hidan. Where is this bitch we have to capture anyway? Kakuzu wordlessly grabbed Hidan's head and turned his gaze towards a blonde woman standing in the room they had entered rather forcibly. She looked back at the two Akatsuki immortals before turning to sprint down one of the long hallways of the building. Well there goes any hope of an easy capture. Let's go. Ordered Kakuzu as he took off after the blonde, Hidan right on his tail. The two chased the girl down the long hallway, which led them further downwards into another tunnel, this one with several inches of water. The fuck? Kakuzu, what the hell is this place? Yelled Hidan, getting a nasty feeling in his gut about their location already. I believe we're going down a sewer maintenance line, informed Kakuzu calmly. God damn it, shouted Hidan. Let's just end this shit quickly. Hidan threw his triple-bladed scythe at the hidden cloud Jinchuriki still fleeing from them. The red weapon flew far further and straighter than it had any right to, and the blonde Jonan was only able to dodge it once they entered a larger tunnel that seemed to be where the rest of the sewer tunnels connected. Even with the extra maneuvering room, she barely managed to evade the deadly weapon. You missed. Informed Kakuzu. And you call yourself a member of Akatsuki. Shut the fuck up Kakuzu. Shouted Hidan. A flick of his wrist yanked the scythe back into his hand by the thick cable attached to the weapon's bottom. Hidan looked away from his partner to address the girl they had been pursuing, who had inexplicably stopped to face them. Good job getting out of the way of my attack, but I am the slowest member of Akatsuki. I just can't hit anything, can I? Hey, Hidan. She's the two-tails Jinchuriki, said Kakuzu, turning to his partner. You'll die if you get careless and tell her all your weaknesses like that. Don, give me that shit Kakuzu, said Hidan. He turned to face the target, though he continued to address Kakuzu. If she could kill me, I'd welcome it. So you are Akatsuki. I knew something was up when I got this mission. The hidden cloud would never risk one of their Jinchuriki like this. But now that I know you're Akatsuki, I can't let you leave here alive. One hand seal later, and all the explosive notes that had been hidden in the entry arches to the main sewer line exploded, sealing the entrances and exits with walls of rubble. I'll kill you here and now. Oh, well that happened, said Hidan. I'd suggest another course of action though. When people get all enthusiastic about fighting and killing, I get all excited about fighting and killing. I go like, screw the objective, I just want to kill everything. 
It's an awesome feeling, but we have to take you alive and all, so maybe we could just talk this over. Talk this over? Asked the Jinchuriki incredulously. Yeah. This whole, not killing thing goes against my religion entirely. I may not look it, but I'm a very devout man. And if there's one thing Jishinism is all about, it's killing. Leaving you alive after fighting you would just be wrong. Maybe you could just come quietly. Asked Hidan. Are you stupid? Asked both the target and Kakuzu at the same time. The hidden cloud ninja was the only one to continue from there though. In the name of Yugito Ni of the hidden cloud, I will kill you. The water at her feet, which had previously been calmly rippling, began to shoot up violently from the sheer force of her chakra. Kakuzu took the time to ready himself, while Hidan was standing completely silent with his necklace raised to his forehead in prayer to Jashin. Yugito's hair tie snapped, allowing her blonde hair to stand on end as if she were standing on a large fan. Blue, flame-like chakra erupted from her body. It took the form of a two-tailed cat made entirely of blue flames, giving the demon a wraith-like appearance. Its eyes, one green and one yellow, gazed down at the Akatsuki members it now dwarfed. Hey Kakuzu, said Hidan, finishing up his prayer. It looks like she's more of a pussy than a bitch. Hidan's quip was punctuated by a large paw made entirely of chakra smashing him into the concrete floor. The cat's maw opened wide and shot an enormous fireball at Kakuzu point blank. Kakuzu hardened his skin with a single hand seal to survive the blast, but the building the sewer line was housed under didn't, and exploded violently. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
Regardless of the moronic name that graced it, the world method caused the two spikes of iron sand embedded in the tails of the tailed beast to explode outwards from the middle, where they intersected the inside of the turtle's shell. The three tails roared in pain as its tails were utterly decimated by the sand running along their lengths. The third tail shot at Sasori, who was forced to move from his place on the tree's branches. The turtle seemed to have some intelligence in its one visible eye as it shot another water bullet the size of a cathedral at Sasori midair. Sasori didn't feel like wasting chakra on another black mountain range, and settled on avoiding the attack by pulling himself downwards by the chakra strings connected to the third case cage below. He was a tad too slow however, and the bottom edge of the jutsu blew his head clean off his shoulders and sent it flying. Most ninja would be dead, but Sasori was member of Akatsuki. As such, he was decidedly not normal. A chakra string emerged from his headless body and connected to the red-haired head. The head came flying back to him, and snapped right back into place, if backwards. Sasori's head spun right around so the three tails could see just how irritated he was. The puppeteer's brown eyes narrowed as the third case cage's iron sand rained down from above in fist-sized balls. Iron sand. Drizzle. That did it, Sasori was going to rename every last one of these stupid jutsu. The, drizzle, technique did little more than annoy the three tails, since the beast managed to close the armor over its face in time. Sasori scowled as the armor opened back up to reveal a completely undamaged eye. The three tails roared loudly, the sheer power behind the sound tearing up some of the closer branches. The giant turtle raised its head up and opened its mouth wide. Sasori's eyes widened at the sight of the demonic chakra so dark red it was almost black gathering in front of the monster's mouth. It congealed into the infamous tailed beast ball and was quickly flying at Sasori. The famed puppeteer knew he couldn't stop an attack of that power, and decided instead to deflect the ball of concentrated death. Iron Sand. Whirling Shield. Sasori allowed himself a small smile as the black dust gathered into a hollow cone facing him and began spinning. The previous name of the technique had been Desert Whirlpool, which made no sense to Sasori, as whirlpools weren't found in the desert under any circumstances. The Tailed Beast Ball, a perfectly sensible name for a ball of chakra produced by a tailed beast, was exactly as large as the diameter of the hollow cone and began to slow as it ground through the spinning sand. Just as Sasori sensed the spinning iron about to give way, he willingly collapsed the right side of the cone. The change in resistance sent the attack flying off to the right of Sasori, and it missed by a mile. Sasori was glad it did too, seeing as it destroyed the section of shore it hit, dug a deep trench as it continued into the surrounding forest, then exploded violently. Sasori's puppets would have been decimated, and in fact, some of the iron sand had been vaporized, rendering it unusable. The dust that used to be sand fell away from the edges of the cone as the shape inverted, point facing the three tails. The beast had apparently counted Sasori as dead the moment the tailed beast ball had been launched, and was busy swiping Zetsu clones off of its shell with the one good tail it had left. Sasori decided to correct that mistake. No one, man, ninja, or even tailed beast disregarded Sasori of the red sand like that. Iron sand. Drill shot. The inverted whirling shield shot at three tails unsuspecting face. The chakra in the iron sand must have sparked some recognition with the three tails, and it turned to face the burst of chakra. The, burst of chakra, turned out to be a massive drill made of poisoned iron dust that bore into the beast's one good eye. This understandably caused excruciating pain. Spread from both the tails and now the face, Sasori's poison began to kick in. Sasori would be surprised if it proved fatal to a tailed beast, but the powerful toxin coupled with the hundreds of white Zetsu clones draining chakra from the monster during the entire fight, and the three tails just couldn't stay up anymore. The giant turtle collapsed in an armored heap onto the tree branches, and actually tore through them into the lake where it floated like a discarded twig. The white Zetsu clones that had avoided being crushed detached from the three tails hide and leapt up onto the tree branches. The ones that had died were tossed into the lake by the surviving clones, and they quickly dissolved into a white mush. Sasori sealed his case cage puppet into its special scroll as Zetsu's two halves emerged from the wood beside him. You never told me you could use the wood style, said Sasori as he unsealed his puppet armor Hiroko and entered it. When he next spoke, his voice had been artificially deepened. It seems rather handy to be able to convert any battlefield to your advantage. 
Earth style jutsu are one thing, but the first Hokage's jutsu is on an entirely different level. Yeah, you never said you could do that. Man, was I surprised. Said a white zetsu, presumably the original, as he and his other half fused back together. Why? You make your clones with the wood style. And you've known I could use it offensively for years. Oh yeah, I forgot. Sasori rolled his eyes, secure in the knowledge that the action would not be translated through Hiroko. Let's just get this tailed beast to the hideout. I'd hate to keep it waiting. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
Kakuzu was the first to realize what had happened, and took it upon himself to explain the strange phenomenon to Hidan, lest they be there all day. You have the blood of the two tails. This is the Jinchuriki. Your ritual is now useless unless you can get the girl's blood, stated Hidan calmly. The Jinchuriki had gotten over her opponent's self-mutilation and grown her fingernails to dagger-like lengths with an audible gleam. Bullshit. What's the damn difference? shouted Hidan. Regardless of his whining, the silver-haired Akatsuki member ran at the Jinchuriki slashing like a madman with his scythe. The blades were all blocked by the long claws the Jinchuriki had grown, but Hidan would not be rebuffed that easily. He continued swinging wildly, not giving Yugito a moment's rest. She was so focused on not giving any of her blood to the creep that she missed the black shadow that appeared behind him for a split second before attacking. Wind style. Pressure damage. Kakuzu declared the name of his attack for his thread creature, since the monster didn't have vocal cords of his own. He could have remained silent, but Kakuzu prided himself on his naming skill, and took every feasible opportunity to declare a new one. The blunt wind smashed into Hidan and Yugito. They were both sent flying, but just like before, Hidan was absolutely fine. He even managed to use the blunt wind as a propellant for his own attack. Yugito landed painfully against one of the semi-standing concrete walls of the building. The impact became even more painful when Hidan landed on top of her. His knees broke several ribs prompting Yugito to cough blood onto Hidan's face, and his black spike drove itself through her hands and into the wall. Hidan gave into gravity and fell to the ground, but Yugito remained pinned to the wall, hanging by her hands. Hidan drew another ritual circle as quickly as he could, and it was a testament to his familiarity with the circumscribed triangle that he managed it with almost no deviation from the perfect lines of the symbol of Jashin. He licked a bit of the blood off of his face, and his skin took on a deep black hue. White markings appeared as well in shapes reminiscent of a stylized skeleton atop the pitch black skin. He removed another spike from his tattered and bloodstained Akatsuki cloak and snapped it into its fullest length. Raising his face to the sky, Hidan began praying extremely loudly. Lord Jashin, accept this pittance of pain and suffering, doubled for you glory, as recompense for my transgressions against the commandments of your ways. For today I leave this woman alive for the future goals of your divine mission. The postponement of her death will be repaid by a painful and long death later to appease your great wishes. Please accept the apologies of your most faithful follower and continue to grant your blessings to me that I may keep the commandments and way of Jashin. Amen. With that, Hidan drove the spike through his abdomen, purposely missing every vital organ. Yugito gave one excruciating scream that seemed to last forever as her blood practically exploded over the wall she was still pinned to. The scream died down to a pitiful whimper before she finally lost consciousness and stopped struggling against the spike that ran through her palms to keep her in place. Kakuzu looked around at the scene, the complete devastation of the surrounding area, the fires that still raged, and the blood that coated almost everything. Any child passing by would have been scarred for life. Kakuzu's gaze finally settled on his partner, who was laying flat on his back as if dead, an image helped by the black metal spike protruding from his stomach. He was mumbling what appeared to be more prayers. Kakuzu had lived for a long time, and had acquired a good deal of patience and respect for religions, even if they all worshipped the wrong thing. He decided to give Hidan some time to finish his stupid ritual to his ridiculous god, but he got fed up after about 30 minutes. It was clear Hidan had no intentions of stopping anytime soon, and the Jinchuriki was bleeding out while whimpering in pain, having long since regained consciousness. Hidan, it's already been 30 minutes. Aren't you done yet? Asked Kakuzu. Shut up. Don't interfere with the ritual. Yelled Hidan, sitting up slightly as the markings faded from his skin. It's bad enough I don't get to kill her now as per the commandments, so the ritual is extra important this time around. It's a pain for me too, you know. Ouch. Hidan mumbled the last part as he pulled the weapon out of his stomach. Kakuzu's witty retort was cut off by the voice of God himself speaking into their minds. We have another one. The two turned to each other and nodded. Kakuzu was the one to send the message to the leader of Akatsuki, claiming the capture of another tailed beast. The usual alert rang through the minds of all members of Akatsuki, before a more privatized message came directed at Hidan and Kakuzu. Zetsu will be along to collect your Jinchuriki and bring it to the ceiling location. Guard it until then. 
Hidan looked up at Kakuzu expectantly. Kakuzu sighed and reached into his Akatsuki cloak. He pulled out a bundle of black cloth with red clouds and tossed it to Hidan, who quickly changed cloaks into one that wasn't tattered, burnt, and coated in blood. Yet. Chapter 12. Two at once, they're catching up Naruto, said Didera as Akatsuki sealed both the three tails and the two tails. The three tails was slowly but surely losing mass as its very being was absorbed into the sealing statue, while the Jinchuriki of the two tails was having her tenant's chakra sucked out the old-fashioned way. Yeah, we'll need to get back on that, said Naruto. He turned his golden eyes to the Akatsuki's resident spymasters. Is the fox still hiding in the hidden leaf? Sasori's puppet body turned to face the young blonde team. Unless the Jinchuriki is out on a mission at the moment, he should still be in the village itself. You can't seriously be considering an attack on the Hidden Leaf village. My pathetic village was one thing, but the Hidden Leaf is on an entirely different level. Ah, you do care about us, said Didera in a high girlish tone. Trust us on this one, we'll be fine. So you'll be in the land of fire then? Asked Kakuzu gruffly. Unless they've moved the largest of the hidden villages since last I've heard, yes Kakuzu. We'll be in the land of fire, replied Naruto, tone laden with sarcasm. Hilarious. Deadpan Kakuzu. Hidan and I will be in the area as well, hunting for funds. If you have time, perhaps you'd like to assist us in destroying a temple. It might lure your Jinchuriki out of the village proper. We help you get your target and you help us get ours, I don't see why not. Naruto turned to his partner for confirmation. Didera. I don't have a problem with it. I get to blow stuff up either way. If their plan doesn't work, I get to turn twice as many places into works of art. Shrugged Didera. Let's do it. All right then. We'll meet outside the fire temple. And Didera. Kakuzu turned the Akatsuki's explosives expert. I'm after bounties, so try to leave the bodies recognizable. Didera grinned, though she knew her face would still be a shadowy blob to the others. No promises. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
Hold it right there, little missy. Conan looked over her shoulder to see an old man with a sword pointed to her back. I don't know how you got here, but I'd suggest turning right around and leaving this place if you know what's good for you. Conan's amber eyes closed, and she let out a sigh. She had been hoping to not leave any corpses. She turned to face him, and something shot out of her sleeve too fast to track for all but the highest level ninja. The old man might have been able to see it in his prime, but as he was now, the paper shuriken caught him in between the eye, and he dropped like a sack of rocks. Tin B. Conan turned back to face the mansion fortress at the sound of the young girl's shriek. The young blonde ignored Conan for a moment and ran past her to the dead man on the ground. Tin B. Wake up. You can't be dead. You have to keep protecting me, remember? Tears welled in her eyes as she continued to shake the old man's corpse. The girl's pleas fell on dead ears though, there was no one to hear her but the Akatsuki member that had just done the deed. Conan readied herself to kill the girl as well folding another piece of paper in her sleeve with one hand as quickly as only an expert could, and then hardened the material with her chakra until it was as sharp as any steel. The deadly origami flew from her sleeve at the back of the girl's head, but was intercepted halfway by a bubble of all things. The shuriken punctured the bubble, which exploded in a cloud of smoke. When the smoke cleared, the young blonde girl was gone. In her place stood an older man with jet black hair covering his left eye. His blue kimono was open to his waist, displaying a figure that was neither muscular nor scrawny, holding a bamboo tube. In his right hand was a metal bubble blower. Why are you here? Despite a glare that positively shot daggers, he took the time to address Conan as if there was still some hope for a peaceful resolution. Conan didn't deign to answer, instead throwing a veritable stream of paper shuriken at the man. In a feat impossible for all but the best ninja, he managed to block every single one with the metal tube in his hand. You didn't hesitate to kill Tin B, but there wasn't a single shuriken aimed at a lethal area when you attacked me. I'll ask again, what do you want with me? Conan looked him dead in the eye as she replied. I am Akatsuki. We will usher in a new era of peace using the nine-tailed beasts. As Jin Shuriki of the six tails, we need the tailed beast within you. As if on some unspoken cue, the two S-ranked missing ninjas jumped back. Conan loosed another handful of paper shuriken, while Yutakata dipped his bubble blower into the bamboo tube at his waist and blew several bubbles. Conan's shuriken were traveling faster, and popped the bubbles, which all exploded in various elements. Some released powerful flames when they burst, others gallons of water. Yutakata was back on the offensive immediately, blowing bubbles with much higher velocity, easily capable of breaking bones. Conan was forced back again and again as Yutakata slowly advanced. Conan dodged a bubble once more, and her heels almost slipped off the edge of the mountain. Yutakata noticed as well, smirking before he dipped his blower in the soapy water once more. This time, a barrage of suds came flying at Conan. The blue-haired woman made one hand seal before falling backwards over the edge. Yutakata turned around marveling at how easy it was to defeat a member of Akatsuki. He had never heard of the organization, but they had seemed rather competent. He should have known that it wouldn't be that easy, whipping around as a large shadow obscured the sun. His eyes widened in wonder at what he saw. The woman from before was flying with white wings made of the paper she had been trying to kill him with. Her legs were also conspicuously missing, though give the look of her bottom edge, it seemed she was actually made out of paper and had taken the paper for her wings out off of her bottom half. He supposed it made sense. What use were legs when you could fly? As fast as he had turned, he was still too slow to avoid the attacks that were already heading his way. The large paper spikes dug into his knees, inducing one of the most painful things he had experienced since his master had tried to remove the six tails from him. Yutakata decided to risk one last warning before he went all out on this paper user. Hotaru. Run. Hotaru, the girl from before emerged from behind one of the trees on the grassy mountaintop. No. I won't leave you. Conan thought it was a foolish sentiment, though she understood where it was coming from. Yutakata didn't care for sentiment at the moment though. I'll be fine, but I can't go all out if you're here. The pain in his shattered kneecaps was threatening to send him into unconsciousness. If you ever thought of me as your master, run. It was all he could do. The noxious red chakra of the six tails flowed out of him, covering him like a second skin. Six red tails swung lazily behind him as his reason became clouded by an unstoppable rage. 
Yutakata gave a fearsome roar, and his tail shot out at the flying paper user as Hotaru ran towards the spiral staircase to the foot of the mountain. Conan dodged the first five, but the sixth hit her square in the chest. Yutakata grinned victoriously, and then roared again when Conan burst into a flurry of paper. The pages flew at him like a swarm of bats, obscuring his vision. He swung his arms like a child trying to swat a fly, and the papers seemed to thin out. He grinned once more, but wouldn't let his guard down like before. It was due to his caution that he managed to jump away from the exploding notes on the ground before they exploded. While he was in midair, another spear of paper came out of nowhere to impale his right arm, pinning it to the side of his body. Yutakata hit the ground hard, and his dulled mind decided to rest for a second and let the power of his tailed beast heal his wounds. This turned out to be the opening Kona was looking for, as her pages flew in and wrapped him like a present, sticking to his skin until there wasn't an inch of skin showing. Yutakata was the Jinchuriki of the Six Tails though, and he wouldn't be held back by such a measly barrier. Underneath the paper body bag, the red chakra turned a shade of light purple. The paper began to hiss and dissolve as Conan watched from above. Yutakata broke out with one final burst of acidic chakra and stared back at Conan. He opened his mouth and shot out a jet of acid. Conan exploded into a tornado of paper as the concentrated jet of acid shot harmlessly through her. Obscured as she was by the paper, Conan reformed the upper half of her body higher up in the tornado of paper and gathered a smaller cylinder of pages in her right hand. Yutakata noticed her as the amount of paper lessened to reveal a Conan holding the paper cylinder, which compressed to form a large spear. The weapon was hurled at Yutakata, who tried to dodge the obvious attack. He closed his mouth to stop the flow of acid and jumped backwards. Right into one of Conan's paper clones. The paper construct slammed its palms into Yutakata's chest and exploded. The blast launched the six tails Jinchuriki backwards, right into the path of Conan's weapon. Yutakata still managed to avoid the weapon by using one of his six chakra tails to throw himself to the side once more. The spear still stabbed his tail, and went through it a good ways into the ground. Yutakata roared in pain, and his screams only increased in volume when the explosive tags littered throughout the paper spear exploded. Conan looked on expressionless throughout it all. Another wave of her hand, and the paper fluttering around her flew at the screaming Jinchuriki and covered him in paper. The acid would have no doubt eaten through the paper as it had before, but Conan didn't give Yutakata the precious seconds for the acid to do its work. Each tag-sized sheet of paper that coated Yutakata was in fact an explosive tag. Individually they were devastating weapons capable of taking out even the most experienced ninja. En masse, Conan could turn them into bombs to rival Didara's. The tags exploded, and Yutakata was launched by the explosion off the edge of the cliff. His tail struggled to find purchase on the cliff face, but simply couldn't dig in deep enough, fast enough to stop his descent. He landed heavily in a cloud of debris at the bottom, a fall that would have no doubt killed most ninja. But Jinchuriki were not most ninja, and Conan was not going to fail pain due to some unconfirmed sense of victory. To ensure that the Jinchuriki was down for the count, several dozen more explosive tags flew down into the dust cloud and added to the commotion. When the smoke cleared, Yutakata lay broken and bleeding, no demonic chakra in sight. Conan allowed herself a small indulgent grin. She took little pleasure in killing, unlike some members of Akatsuki, but she was good at it. And no matter how perverse the profession, there was some joy in excellence. Her paper coated the Jinchuriki, this time for transport rather than asphyxiation, leaving a small opening for air around the mouth. It floated up to the femme fatale, and they headed out into the night. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
I am well aware of the fact that we walk everywhere. Contrary to what you seem to think, flight is not so easily obtained, replied Kakuzu. Naruto often styled himself as the more mature one in their team, but even he enjoyed heckling his seniors from time to time. It is for us. Maybe if you ask nicely, Didera could make you a bird, for a fee. I do not waste money, said Kakuzu immediately. He then looked to be on the verge of complaining about the long walks and demand that Kakuzu pay for air fare, but the conversation was moving a tad too fast for him. Besides, as long as Jashin got his tribute at the end of the day, who cared how long it took to get there? But walking sure wastes time, said Didera in mocking lament. And time is money. Naruto finished his partner's sentence, looking at the two immortals with a small smirk. Kakuzu seemed genuinely torn by the logic for a moment, before steeling himself against further conflicting emotions. I will not give a Ryo when I could save one instead. We'll walk. Kakuzu, I don't want to walk all the way there, whined Hidan. Just pay the damn fee. It'll be so much faster. Now now Hidan, scolded Naruto mockingly. Kakuzu's made his decision for the both of you. You've made your bed, and now you have to sleep in it. Naruto joined Didera on her owl, a form he had insisted on, and the two blondes rose farther away. See you at the top. As it turned out, it would be several hours before Kakuzu and Hidan joined the two at the fire temple. Well, look who deigned to grace us with their presence, greeted Didera mockingly. Let's just get this over with, grumbled Kakuzu. He and Naruto stood side by side in front of the large iron doors that barred the entrance to the fire temple. Flanked on either side by two imposing statues, the seal-reinforced doors looked as strong as they were. Kakuzu most likely couldn't see it as his right fist took on a dark brown hue and solidified to become harder than diamonds, but Naruto could see the chakra flowing through the complex seal as clear as day. Not that those would stop them. Kakuzu and Naruto both pulled their right hands back, balled into fists, and swung at the iron doors. Despite the seal's design to make them impregnable, the doors went flying off their hinges and into the temple's courtyard. It was clear that no one inside had been expecting the doors to suddenly soar inwards, and nobody opposed the four Akatsuki members as they slowly walked in. Didera, never one for guile and subtlety, broke the awkward silence. We're looking for someone named, Chikariku. Didera turned to Kakuzu, who simply showed her his bingo book in exasperation. Chiraku. We're looking for Chiraku. If he come out now, well, we'll still level the place and kill everyone to send a message, but we'll feel worse about it. The monks were mostly pacifists, and though they trained in taijutsu and some even dabbled in ninjutsu, none of them could hold a candle to an actual ninja. Their terror was lessened as they moved out of the way to make room for a monk who carried himself like he was in charge. He was bald, as were all the monks, neither old nor young, and wore the traditional robes that all the monks of the fire temple wore. All in all, he was entirely unremarkable, save for two things. The first was the absolute fury in his eyes directed to the Akatsuki members, and the second was the cloth wrapped around his waist with the kanji for fire emblazoned upon it. He might be a monk now, but this was unmistakably Chiraku, former member of the Twelve Guardian Ninja. What business do you have in this temple? He asked, though it was obvious he didn't really care. These two are here for your bounty, but my partner and I are here to stir up trouble and bring the hidden leaf into things. If you want to send a messenger now, go ahead. I won't guarantee that there will be anyone left alive after this to carry a message for help, offered Naruto. He then seemed distressed by the offer to let one of the monks go, but by some act of God he held his tongue. It was an act of Jashin, forcing Hidan to pray in silence before spilling the blood of his foes in the ritual, which he would make especially painful for these pacifist freaks. If you are as evil as you seem, I will accommodate you here and now. I'll kill you to prevent your wicked acts from continuing. During his threats, Chiraku raised his hands into strange stance, one hand in a half ram seal and the other with the palm facing the ground. Welcoming approach, thousand armed murder. Naruto's eyes widened as he saw the golden spirit of cannon form behind the ninja monk, who stood as still as a statue, glaring at the Akatsuki members. Judging by the expressions of the other three in the group, he was the only one who could. Deciding that their talents would best be served fighting threats they could see, Naruto addressed his allies. I'll handle this guy. You can look for more bounties and cause havoc in the temple. He then lowered his necklace and smiled. 
Now there's an order I can get behind. Kakuzu, how come you never let me cut loose like this? Hidan didn't wait for a response and ran off, chasing some monks into one of the temple's side building. Kakuzu looked at Naruto strangely for a second, but soon forgot when he saw Chikaku, a old bounty, but still worth quite a bit. Didera looked at Naruto and shrugged as she turned away. If you say so, I'm going to show these guys what real art is. A large clay lizard appeared beside her, and she rode it in a direction that hadn't been taken yet, right past Chiraku into the main temple building. Chiraku's face contorted in anger at their flippant disregard of his declaration to protect the temple, and Naruto saw the angelic goddess behind him mirror the expression, morphing into a red demon. The demon's face was furious, and one of its thousand fists shot out at Didera. Naruto wasn't about to let his partner be blindsided by such an attack, and jumped in between the phantom blow and the mad bomber. His fist met the significantly larger demons but the power of sage mode prevailed again, and the red fist was torn to shreds of chakra by the burst of sage chakra. Naruto looked up at Chiraku, who stood once more in front of a golden goddess with a surprised expression on his face, and smirked. Sorry, but I'm your opponent here. Chiraku was quick to recover, and retorted in kind. I am Chiraku of the Fire Temple, and I won't lose to the likes of you. Naruto rushed the monk, watching as the jutsu he was attacking become enraged once more. This time, it attacked with more than one fist, and Naruto would have taken a massive blow if he was unable to see the phantom attacks. As it was, he deftly maneuvered around the punches, drawing ever closer to Chiraku himself. Naruto jumped over a fist that materialized particularly close, then took a punch full in the face while in midair. The blow hurt a surprising deal, and Naruto had no doubt that without sage mode, it would have likely incapacitated him. As it was the blow sent him flying back, or it would have, if he had not been intercepted halfway by another fist. The pummeling continued, and the red demon practically juggled him for a short while before launching a particularly strong blow that sent him flying. He would have some bruises in the morning, but not too bad for a supposedly lethal barrage. It was clear the man's jutsu made him superior to even Naruto in close combat. The monk's technique could launch attacks from any direction at any time, making it impossible to predict. Not even the Sharingan would have been able to react in time. So Naruto settled on killing Chiraku at a distance. Sage art. Inorganic incarnation. Connected to the earth with sage chakra better than any earth chakra, Naruto used his chakra to give life temporarily to the rocks below the fire temple. The earth below Chiraku erupted as if it wanted to kill the monk. Taken off guard by the loss of footing, Chiraku reached out with his hands to keep upright. Naruto raised his hands from the ground, removing the life-giving chakra from the earth they stood on, when he saw the golden goddess behind Chiraku fading. His jutsu was clearly tied to that strange stance he had adopted before the fight. Naruto rushed the ninja monk while he was still off balance. To Chiraku's credit, he recovered quickly, just in time to come eye to eye with one of the only practitioners of sage mode in the world. Naruto sent a simple jab into the monk's stomach, which the former member of the Twelve Guardian Ninja blocked. The hand that caught his punch slowed Naruto's strike down about as much as a wet tissue paper. Chiraku was sent flying across the courtyard, and landed heavily in the dirt. He rose as quickly as he could and attempted to regain his stance to fend off the Akatsuki member, but Naruto wouldn't give him a second. The sage's next punch was enough to end it. Chiraku wasn't sent hurtling through the air by this attack, instead being caught by Naruto's other hand. After all, it wouldn't do to have Kakuzu's bounty go soaring off the mountain. Hidan had stopped caring about Kakuzu's precious money the moment he was out of sight. He might have been the slowest member of Akatsuki, but when compared to people like Itachi and Naruto, he never really stood a chance there. As it was, he was incredibly fast ninja, easily capable of catching up to some monks with minimal ninja training. The slaughter was quick and bloody, resulting in the hallway he had caught up to them and getting an impromptu paint job. The bloodshed didn't last nearly as long as he had intended, and it left him sprinting through the fire temple, looking for his next victim. He continued this way for a short while, hunting down monks whenever he saw them. 
he'd passed Kakuzu, who had some midget's corpse over his shoulder. Deciding to ignore his partner for the time being, Hidan turned the other way and continued to hunt for tributes to Jashin. After a while longer, it seemed like he had gotten them all, and so went back to the courtyard. Kakuzu was looming ominously above two corpses, probably the two guys with the largest bounties in the area, and Naruto was meditating like he was in some kind of serene glade, not a wrecked temple they had just slaughtered. Didera was making clay butterflies, which would fly into the air and explode in bright colors. It wasn't a skill used often in combat, but it helped pass the time. Did we get all the peaceful fuckers? Asked Hidan. Neither he nor Kakuzu was censors, but he had a basic grasp of the skills possessed by other Akatsuki members. He knew enough about the two blondes to realize that if he had missed anyone, Naruto could sense them. Sure enough, the sage opened his eyes and whirled around, Kanai flying. A yelp was heard from behind the pillar he had just hit, and Naruto turned to Hidan. Remember, we need to send a message to the hidden leaf. So we'd prefer scared to dead. We'd prefer scared to dead. Repeated Hidan mockingly as he rolled his eyes. Honestly, I'm not fucking five. Hidan stalked over to the pillar, where the last monk was no doubt cowering in fear. The idiot had likely been waiting for the Akatsuki members to leave the courtyard to make a run for it and get help. Hidan rounded the corner, side ready to stop any desperate attack by a desperate monk. Instead he got a sharp kick to the shin. Hopping on one leg from the pain, Hidan looked down to see not the monk he had been expecting, but a terrified little boy, likely a monk in training. He wore a scaled-down version of the monk's garb, and had short brown hair. Regaining his composure and clearing his throat, Hidan put his scythe away, confident that he could beat a child, even if he could die. Oi, ya little shit, we need you for something. It was clear that Hidan's great charisma wouldn't convince him to come willingly towards the four people who had just massacred a temple of pacifists. Hidan settled for grabbing his hair and dragging the child, kicking and screaming in horror, out into the courtyard. The other three Akatsuki members raised eyebrows at the sight of the young boy, but otherwise remained as intimidating as they were expected to be. Once he drew close enough, Hidan tossed the boy unceremoniously into the midst of the monsters. Naruto was the first to speak, his voice copying Itachi's terrifying monotone perfectly. Do you know where the Hidden Leaf Village is? It was all the boy could do to nod, looking on in terror through tear-filled eyes. Take a message to them, and we'll let you live, yeah, said Didera, sounding far more sympathetic than Naruto was, and much kinder than Hidan and Kakuzu were even capable of faking. The boy's eyes showed some trace of hope underneath the mind-numbing fear, and Kakuzu took the opportunity to seal the deal. If you don't deliver this message telling them what we've done here today, and that we'll be here for four days, we will know. And we will find you, he growled, rekindling that terror in the boy. We have another one. The four Akatsuki members froze up in unison at the sound of Payne's voice. They all realized that if the boy ran and found a patrol instead of the village, the hidden leaf could be on them while they sat there like ducks and got killed. Something would have to be done to slow him down a bit. Hidan pulled his scythe off of his back and delivered a painful cut to the boy's right leg, eliciting a shriek of pain. We can't have you getting there too fast, now can we? He said, licking the blood off of his red scythe. Get going, ya little shit. Following his advice, the young boy limped out of the temple's broken gates as fast as he could, trailing blood the whole way. That might have been a tad extreme, don't you think? Said Didera, a little sympathetic for the boy. If it weren't for you two, we wouldn't have let him go at all. Said Kakuzu, taking a seat on top of a small cushion positioned on the stairs of the temple for the ceiling. It wasn't long before the other three followed suit. True. Said Naruto. Regardless, let's get this ceiling done with. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
Team 7 through 10 were assembled before her, with one of Donzo's rats filling the spot in Team 7 after her apprentices, run in with Akatsuki. It still brought tears to Tsunade's eyes, that another person she had cared about was taken from her. This time though, it strengthened her resolve to end Akatsuki, and to that end she had remained as Hokage. For once in her life, the people who had killed her loved ones had a face and a name. Akatsuki, just the word was enough to make the four teams of hardened ninja tense up, with the exception of Team 8, who had never had the misfortune of meeting Akatsuki face to face. The tales of horror told by the other teams, along with Sakura's absence, was enough to convince them of Akatsuki's power, has attacked the fire temple. Asuma's eyes widened as he took in a sharp intake of air. Tsunade's next word confirmed his fears. Only one person survived, a small boy. The only reason he made it was to send us a message. The hidden leaf can't ignore this kind of assault on our lands. I'm sending all of you to take out the Akatsuki members. They'll leave the temple in another two days, but they've promised to stay there and meet you in battle until then. It's most likely a trap. We'll need a good plan. Shikamaru interrupted Tsunade. Usually a bad idea, but he was usually right, so Tsunade let it slide. You're right of course. But this is one of the only chances we'll ever get to move against Akatsuki. Even if it is on their terms, we'll be able to send reinforcements once they become available. They think they're luring us out, but they don't realize how many leaf ninja they've lured to them. Right now, you are the only ninja present and capable enough to fight Akatsuki until I can send more ninja to back you up. Until then, be careful. We don't want Akatsuki killing any more leaf ninja. Sasuke looked up. Sharingan blazing and lightning chakra crackling down his arm. Don't be surprised if they're all dead when reinforcements arrive. The Uchiha air turned around then and exited the room, determination incarnate, and face contorted in anger. Well, I guess that wraps that up then, chuckled Kakashi, at least having the decency to look sheepish for his students' behavior. Guess we should get ready as quickly as we can, we'll plan on the way there, okay? The others in the room nodded in agreement and all exited the room with a single hand seal and a flicker of movement. For better or worse, Akatsuki and the Hidden Leaf would clash once more. Chapter 13. The four teams of Leaf Ninja were en route to the Fire Temple when the subject they were all thinking about came up. Having faced Akatsuki the most times out of all of them other than Sora, and being more level-headed about it, since they weren't hunting him, Sasuke was the one to approach the taboo topic. So what strategy do we have to ensure we aren't just handing Sora to them on a silver platter as soon as they kill us all? The question was asked with no sarcasm or ill intent, simply a wish to be prepared, but it effectively killed any joy they were still clinging to. You can't just go asking a question like that. Berated Tenton. Learn some tact. Kakashi held up a hand to stop the argument before it could really begin. He's right though. We're supposed to be stalling for reinforcements, but it's just as likely Akatsuki will kill us all quickly and be off with Sora. That's probably their plan, so they likely won't hold back at all. A drawn-out battle actually favors them here, not us. So then what are we supposed to do? Asked Neji. Stand idly by and let them get what they want. I'll try as hard as I can to prevent that from becoming my fate. Even though the question was aimed at Kakashi, it was Shikamaru who answered it. No. We just need to steamroll them with superior numbers on one front while keeping them busy on the others. We'll also need an escape plan for Sora in case things go south, but I doubt he'd be allowed out of his house if we didn't have one on standby. Correct, Shikamaru, replied Kurenai. As Jonan will take on one of the Akatsuki at a time while you use your teamwork and numbers to keep the other Akatsuki members from interfering. We'll finish our member off as quickly as we can, and move on to help you. As we take them down, we gain more and more momentum. It's far from foolproof, but it's all we have. Kakashi spoke up next to finish the plan. Our escape plan for Sora is actually inspired by our enemy. Naruto isn't the only one who has a summoning contract. Guy, Sasuke, and myself can all reverse summon Sora away from the fire temple at a moment's notice. Shikamaru nodded in agreement, and then asked his last question. If the Jonan are working together, and we'll be working in our teams, then what does the other team do? Neji, who was still listening in, hadn't even though about that, and he was supposed to be a genius. The Hyuga had no doubt it would have occurred to him eventually, 
but his area of expertise was martial arts, not strategy and tactics. Shikamaru might not have had the most potential in the Hyuga clan in the last century, but he was a genius of a different breed. Asuma was the janin to inform them all of the plan this time, falling back into the group as they jumped through the canopy of the Land of Fire's expansive forests. Kakashi's team will be supplementing the others with Ino's support on our team, or added muscle on the other two teams. Sai will be with Guy's team, and Sasuke will be helping Kurinai's team. Your main job will be staying alive, and then keeping them away from us, but if you see an opening, you'll need the power to capitalize on it. Shikamaru couldn't have thought of a better plan himself, given the circumstances and the limited time available to them. It had a lot of holes, and could be thrown into chaos by the two members of Akatsuki who were still complete mysteries beyond a scythe and bloodlust. But it was the best they could think of, and it depended on their combat ability against Akatsuki. Shikamaru looked around at the Chunin, and Neji, who would be going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Akatsuki to gauge their confidence. Kiba was confident, and Shino was as calm as ever, but they had never faced Akatsuki before, and Shikamaru was glad Sasuke would be keeping them alive. Hinata wasn't as excited as her teammates, though if she knew what awaited them, she might just crawl up into a ball and never move again. Out of the people who had faced Akatsuki before, Sora seemed eager for a rematch, and Sasuke seemed downright determined to win. And ever since the Land of Honey, and Sasuke's first encounter with Akatsuki, he hadn't been anything close to that when facing Akatsuki. It made Shikamaru wonder just what Sasuke had up his sleeve. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
Sasuke then raised his left hand and pointed at Hidan with two fingers. A spike of lightning chakra shot out and impaled Hidan's heart. As if to make absolutely sure was dead, the tip of the Chidori spear split into countless others of varying lengths. The end result was an Akatsuki member that looked like a pin cushion for bolts of lightning. The lightning retreated to Sasuke's hand and he jumped at Didera with his sword in hand. The element of surprise had been lost though, and Didera easily dodged onto a clay falcon she had made beforehand. The evasion turned out to be unnecessary though, as Sasuke had to twist around mid-lunge to block a ray of lightning chakra from behind him. The blade absorbed the lightning chakra, as it was designed to, and the lightning jutsu ended. Sasuke's Sharingan widened at sight of the very alive and very not decapitated Akatsuki member standing up before him. Amen. Sasuke's head whipped to face the Akatsuki member he had just impaled several times over, who was whirling his arms as if he were warming up for a morning workout. Man, I get kind of out of it when I'm praying. Naruto, when are those leaf bastards getting here? The silver-haired Akatsuki member paused for a second, before shouting once more. The fuck? Who the fuck stabbed me? Was it you, you little shit? I bet it was. I'll fucking murder you. That hurt, you know. Even as surprised as he was, Sasuke easily dodged the slow, predictable swing of Hidan's scythe. He leapt back onto his hawk, which retreated to a safer distance. It wasn't safe enough, since Kakuzu was not pleased at having his head cut off and his fire-style heart destroyed. Water-style. Bursting collision. It wasn't the most unique jutsu, but Kakuzu substituted the lack of effects and skill with an ungodly amount of sheer force. The torrent of water bore down on Sasuke, but was stopped dead in its tracks. Earth style. Dividing ramparts. Two massive walls of stone emerged from the ground around Kakuzu, cutting him off from the other three members of Akatsuki. It would be little trouble to convert the walls to rubble, but Kakuzu saw what the leaf ninja were trying to do. Not that it would help them. If anything, separating the Akatsuki members just allowed them to not worry about hurting each other. In preparation for actual combat, Kakuzu discarded his Akatsuki cloak. He scowled, not that anyone could see it through his mask, when he saw the four ninja in front of him, none of whom he recognized. Which meant they weren't worth anything. The Hayuga's eyes might have been worth something if he wasn't a member of the branch family, which was unlikely, and the others were likely Chunin. This was both good news and bad news. Bad because he wouldn't be making a profit on these brats, but good because he didn't have to leave the bodies in a recognizable condition to collect his money. xxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxx
Naruto raised an eyebrow at the green-clad Jonin that had spoken and pointed at him, rather dramatically. You cannot prevail against us, and it makes me sad to tell you why. Sure enough, the black-haired man had rivers of tears rolling down his cheeks. If he wasn't preparing to kill them, Naruto would have found the sight hilarious. You have lost, your springtime of youth. The words were said like Naruto was being accused of a crime worse than murder. Fortunately, the other three leaf ninja didn't seem to share their comrades' sentiments. What? Naruto honestly couldn't contain his curiosity, and he was sure he would regret it. Your springtime of youth. To see a young man such as yourself committing such detestable acts at a tender age without remorse. Naruto was right, he regretted asking. You should be enjoying these days of uncatchable youth while you can, not killing and stealing. I shall give you one last chance to repent, before I must, cut your youth short. These acts may be detestable to you, but they secure my place in the world Akatsuki will create. This system of war and hatred will come into direct conflict with Akatsuki, and I've just chosen the winning side. It's as simple as that, argued Naruto. Now if you're done blubbering over an enemy, can we begin? If you are truly set on this path to destruction, I shall make sure that you cannot be guilty about all of the pain you will cause. First gate. Open. The Jonin then simply disappeared. Naruto could track him the whole way, but he was taken by surprise by the swiftness of the attack, and so took a solid kick to the bottom of his chin that sent him straight upwards. Wind style. Hurricane palm. The copy ninja earned his nickname with yet another jutsu that he most certainly hadn't invented himself. The blast of wind was blunt, but it had a powerful velocity behind it that wasn't possible with sharp wind. Naruto was sent back to earth almost as fast as he had been sent away from it, and landed with a plume of dust. Demonic illusion. Crimson leaf dream. A flurry of red leaves came from seemingly nowhere around Naruto. Kurinai's hand emerged from each one, stabbing at Naruto with over a hundred kanai. A brief burst of sage chakra shattered the technique with little difficulty, though the return to the real world had its own problems. Flying Swallow. Single line. In a burst of speed, Asuma went from one side of a slightly disoriented Naruto to the other, with no apparent effect. Until a second later, when the ground next to the Akatsuki member practically exploded, leaving a crescent-shaped cut of massive size in the ground. The new holes in his Akatsuki cloak were a testament to the effectiveness of the combo by the Jonin that would have been grievous overkill on any normal ninja. Unfortunately for them, Naruto was anything but a normal ninja. Sage art. Hardening. It was a shameless copy of Kakuzu's signature earth style, with some sage chakra for added potency, but it served its purpose. Naruto's skin returned to its normal color as he faced the leaf Jonin. Well that was a bit of a bore. Is it my turn yet? xxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxx
Didera landed heavily, stood up, and dusted herself off before speaking. Was it that obvious? Despite being, found out, Didara's confident grin never left her face. One thing though. You assume I wasn't already prepared. Didara's left hand formed a half-ram seal and the ground beneath Shino erupted. Before he could blink, Shino was wrapped up by a clay centipede that had hidden underground, placed there by Didara when she had landed. Shino. Damn it. Kiba took a step towards his teammate before deciding against stepping closer to a high-yield explosive. The centipede certainly did explode, but Didara's keen eyes and Sasuke's Sharingan were able to notice the Avarame break apart into thousands of beagles as the bomb went off. Hinata and Kiba were not so lucky as to have the observational skills of an Uchiha or S-ranked ninja. Shino. Hinata looked like she was about to burst into tears, and Kiba looked ready to throw reason and planning out the window. I'm alright. Shino's calm monotone came from behind Hinata. Shino had intended to console his teammates and calm them down before they did something to jeopardize their safety. His voice had the opposite effect however, as Hinata gave a terrified shriek before whirling around to face him. You shouldn't sneak up on people like that. Hinata admonished, though it was likely the softest spoken criticism in history. Didera was incredulous that despite the bug boy identifying the need for her to take time preparing each bomb individually, they were still standing around talking. Her hands chewed the clay meticulously, molding her explosive chakra in the correct ways for what she had planned. Teammate looked back to the Akatsuki member when they heard her technique beginning. Explosive clay minions. Unlike her usual artistic sculptures, a shapeless mess of clay was practically vomited out of her hands. The piles of clay began to almost bubble as they rose up and took shape. Once they were complete, two, people, made of clay stood in front of Didera, connected to her hands by thin cords of her clay. Didera was less than pleased with the look of her minions, clumsy and ugly. It wasn't perfect, but they would become real art soon enough. Sasuke turned to Team 8 and whispered a quick plan. Kiba and Shino will attack her directly. My lightning can disarm her bombs, and the gentle fist may have a similar effect, so Hanada and I will deal with her little soldiers. She won't be able to use her hands or make any more bombs while she's using those creatures. When she drops them to defend against you guys, Hanada and I will join in. We'll keep her on the defensive. Got it. Kiba and Shino nodded, and even Akamaru gave an affirmative bark. The two ninja, three counting Akamaru, then broke away from their huddle to get into position. I comma I don't know if I can do this. Hanada was the least confident member of the team, and was the only one to voice concerns about her role in the plan. What if I screw up? I might get us all killed. She would have no doubt continued hypothesizing worse and worse scenarios that could arise from her shortcomings if Sasuke hadn't stood up to face the clay creations that were lumbering towards them and placed his hand on her shoulder. You are the heiress to the proud Hyuga clan. You can do this, and you will do this, or we may as well give them Sora and go home. Hinata's white eyes widened for a moment, before the veins round her eyes became extremely pronounced. She nodded and faced the threat, sinking into one of the gentle fist's more offensive stances. The clay's monsters were on them then, and they moved with a speed and grace one would expect of their clumsy appearance and bumbling gait. Sasuke easily ducked under a pathetic attempt at a swing, and swiped at the thing with his lightning-enhanced sword. Anyone else would have missed it, but the Sharingan noticed the Chidori sword miss. Sasuke saw in slow motion the clay separate as the blade passed harmlessly between the two halves. The two hunks of clay landed on the ground with a thud, and Sasuke jumped back to avoid a potential explosion after his lightning chakra had, disarmed, the bombs. The two pieces of clay didn't explode though, instead rising up to form two clay minions, each looking more defined and streamlined. Sure enough, when they attacked Sasuke again, the two creatures moved more fluidly and with more speed than their larger counterpart. Hinata. Don't cut them in half. They only multiply. Sasuke shouted a warning to Hinata, who had a parent already found out the hard way. The gentle fist wasn't one of the best styles in the world through sheer luck though, and Hinata was easily avoiding even two opponents at once, even delivering small jabs at the clay. The counterattacks did little more than slow the creatures down for a second, though Hinata was still handling herself incredibly well. Far better than Sasuke, whose style relied on lightning chakra to obliterate his opponents before they could even counterattack at all. 
His Sharingan luckily compensated for his lack of defensive skill, predicting each blow before it happened and letting him dodge with his superior speed. Realizing that he had to do something to short out these bombs, Sasuke unleashed another jutsu he had derived from one of his favorites. Chidori Stream. It was far more chakra intensive to channel lightning chakra through the air, and it was almost impossible to do it through an opponent's wind style. Still, having nothing to dodge but the air itself made the Chidori Stream near impossible to dodge. Sure enough, the clay minions around Sasuke were nailed by the lightning, and fell to the ground, little more than ugly statues. Until a moment later, when they got up as if nothing had happened. Sasuke's Sharingan had noticed what had happened, and while he dodged the stiff attacks from the clay creations, he took a moment to dissect what he had observed. The lightning chakra had clearly had an effect, the same effect that disarmed all of Didara's other bombs and made them useless lumps of clay. The Chidori stream had nailed the creatures and rendered the explosive chakra within them inert. The Sharingan had observed it all, and it also saw the replacement chakra rush down the cords of clay connecting them to Didera to refuel the bombs. So that was how they had escaped the Chidori stream. The effects of the lightning chakra had worn off almost entirely as the clay lost the electrical charge it had gained. Sasuke had to devote more attention to avoiding the attacks of the clay beasts, but he and Hinata didn't have to hold out much longer. Yahoo! Fang over Fang! Kiba and Akamaru swept in from the sides, both whirling at high speed to create miniature tornadoes of teeth and claws that could drill through almost anything. The attack hit Didera, whose hand mouths bit down to sever the cords of clay as her hands came up as if to catch the attacks. The fang over fang landed in a large explosion of dust and debris. Sasuke's Sharingan hadn't seen anything strange before the two mutts hit, but Hinata's Byakugan saw through the cloud of dust like it wasn't even there. She sprinted forward and Sasuke ran after her. The dust settled and the Sharingan instantly saw what made Hinata gasp in concern. The Fang over Fang hadn't created the dust, but rather Didara's bombs that had impacted the Inazuka and his dog. The two were lying injured to either side of the Akatsuki member, who jumped back to get some distance from the Hyuga that was quickly approaching. S rank or not, no one who wasn't mentally challenged a Hyuga at close combat. While Didera was still in the air, Shino struck. Or rather, his insects did. Didera passed through the cloud of beetles and landed on the ground covered in the bugs. Gah! Get these stupid bugs off! Yelled Didera, swatting at her skin to try and get the parasites off of her body. My insects are draining your chakra as we speak. Shino said from behind Sasuke. Sasuke whirled around, concerned that Shino had somehow snuck up on him. Why you ask? because they have been carefully bred by the Abarame clan for generations to do so. This won't last much longer. The insects were the thing that didn't last long though. The beetles could only handle so much of Didara's chakra, which was naturally explosive, before they succumbed to the nature of what they were eating. Ah, shit. That hurts. On the upside, the beetle's self-destruction seemed to be doing Didara a little bit of damage per beetle. Shino on the other hand didn't care, and quickly withdrew his beetles to prevent the loss of his entire hive. Once the bugs returned to their master, Didera was jumped up onto a newly created bird and retreated to a safe distance with a few new scorch marks all over her body. Trying to blow me up. Well fuck you. Didera tossed her other handful of clay, which took the form of, ironically, a swarm of beetles. Chidori Sanban. Sasuke waved a hand of lightning, and a multitude of small slivers of lightning chakra flew out to impale most of the clay insects. Several made it through though, and the leaf ninja were forced to dodge the bombs. Hinata gave a sharp gasp and looked up at Didera out of instinct, even though the Byakugan let her see the artist from virtually any angle. Sasuke followed her gaze, and even the less chakra-sensitive Sharingan could see the mass of chakra gathering between the Akatsuki members' hands. I can't use C4 or C0 with my allies here, and C2 is too good for you. So see how you like my C3. Didara's hands parted to reveal a small butterfly. The creature unassumingly fluttered down towards the leaf ninja, but two of the four could sense the terrifying amounts of chakra inside it. They tried to back off, grabbing Kiba and retreating as far as they could before it exploded. They didn't have long. C3. 
X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X Kakuzu was rather miffed that he didn't get any of the big money Jonan, or even the Uchiha who had taken his fire style heart. He even would have settled for the unsealed Bayakugan that were against Nidera. Those would have fetched a pretty penny. Instead he was stuck fighting four little broths that weren't even a fifth of his age. You've made a grave mistake in challenging me. I have more experience than you'll ever have combined. The Hyuga with the sealed Bayakugan sank low into the stance of the gentle fist. You've made a mistake as well. His comrades didn't seem to be concerned with defending themselves, apparent confident in the Hyuga's abilities. You've entered my realm of divination. Kakuzu had heard that line before, difficult to have not, given how long he had been alive. But he had never seen it used by a member of the branch family. Two palms. Neji slid across the ground a great speed, tapping Kakuzu on the shoulder and hip simultaneously. Four palms. He hit Kakuzu two more times, sealing two more chakra points. Eight palms. Another four blows doubled the number of palms. Sixteen palms. A flurry of blows faster than the others landed another eight hits on the Akatsuki member. Thirty-two palms. Neji's hands were moving faster than most ninja could at this point, and most would have to take his word that he hit Kakuzu another sixteen times. Eight trigrams. Sixty-four palms. A rain of palms fell on Kakuzu, apparently 32 of them, making a grand total of 64 chakra-laced taps to decimate an opponent's chakra system. But Kakuzu was an Akatsuki member, and Akatsuki members were not to be underestimated. Neji knew this and launched the final step of his own technique. 8 trigrams, 128 palms. Kakuzu's eyes widened at the attack name, and Neji launched into a series of 64 attacks faster than all but the most specialized taijutsu experts could see without aid of a bloodline like the Sharingan. The last two palm strikes were delivered at the same time, and had even more chakra behind them to put the final nail in the coffin. The technique was overkill by anyone's definition, so Neji was surprised when Kakuzu put a hand on his right wrist. If you're done trying to poke me to death, can we get on with this? The Hyuga genius's Bayakugan widened as Kakuzu broke his wrist with contempt and he screamed in pain. It was his teammates who came to his rescue, Lee kicking Kakuzu in the side with a massive power only he and Guy likely had. A second kick broke his grip on Neji, who began to rub his shattered hand, and while it didn't seem to do much to damage the Akatsuki member, but not even Kakuzu could ignore such raw strength. He was sent skidding to the side several meters. Kakuzu was a tad surprised by the snakes that appeared to bind him, pinning his arms to his sides. Super Beast Imitation. Sai watched from above on a stylized hawk. Upon a closer look, the snakes wrapped around him appeared to be made of ink and paper. He tried to break out of them, but they were surprisingly resilient, only giving a tiny bit. Then Kakuzu looked up when the sun seemed to disappear, leaving him in a large shadow. Ninja Tools. Giant Iron Lump. As the technique's name insinuated, the shadow was indeed caused by a massive ball of metal above Kakuzu's head that was somehow being brought down by the girl of the team via an equally large chain. The iron ball landed squarely on Kakuzu, then shattered the ground beneath it. Tenton smirked for a moment, before the giant ball moved. It rose several feet into the air, revealing Kakuzu, who tossed it to the side. It's getting irritating to deal with all of you at once. I think I'll stop holding back. Kakuzu discarded his Akatsuki cloak in one fluid motion, revealing the body beneath. His wore a strange backless shirt, and his head remained covered. But on his exposed back, four masks, one shattered, sat among a web of stitches. Kakuzu's entire body appeared to be stitched back together multiple times, like some kind of demented ragdoll. Now let's even the ga. Kakuzu was unceremoniously cut off Neji planting his good hand squarely on one of the masks. The Akatsuki member gave a start as mask shattered, and the open hole where it had been quickly stitched itself shut. My Bayakugan sees all. Even your weak spots. You've been hardening your skin to negate the gentle fist, but these masks aren't nearly as reinforced, and there's a large amount of chakra behind each. You're fated to lose against these eyes. Neji spoke calmly, both to brag a bit and inform his comrades of his discovery. Now let's end this. 
Neji's left hand was brought back again to strike at one of the two remaining masks. He was taken by surprise when the two masks shot out of the Akatsuki member's back, followed by a mass of threads. The holes they had occupied closed rapidly, and Kakuzu's skin became noticeably darker. Neji's Byakugan noticed the threads and masks that had stunned him a bit as they passed take on the forms of demented creatures. One was bipedal, and the mask had a large yellow nose. The other sat on all fours, carrying itself like an alligator, and had blue markings on the cheeks. Water style, contained shockwave. The alligator's mouth opened wide and spewed out a wide wave of water. Neji tried to dodge, but the technique's scale was simply too large, and he was caught up in it. Lightning style, false darkness. The other mask opened its mouth and loosed a blast of electricity, which flowed along the water to Neji. Neji was a jonin of the hidden leaf, and wouldn't fall so easily though. Heavenly rotation. The impenetrable defense of the Hyuga clan world to life around the only branch family member to grasp its secrets and the combination of water and lightning passed harmlessly on either side of him. The rotation slowed as Kakuzu's techniques died down. Neji smirked, glad that he had somehow survived, and hopeful for the future of this fight. Water style. Piercing drill. Neji's white eyes widened in shock as the high-pressured jet of water impaled him through the chest, emerging from the other side stained red with his blood. Kakuzu stood up, and his two thread creatures moved up behind him on either side as Neji hit the ground, motionless. Damn, I was hoping to miss his heart and replace the one he took from me. Oh well. Kakuzu turned to face the three other. Tenten had tears welling up in her eyes, and Lee seemed absolutely furious. Sai was the only one who seemed relatively unperturbed. Three on three are much better odds. I have to warn you kiddos, I'm stronger than I look. Said Hedan menacingly. The tension could be cut with a knife. Now get ready to fucking die. Hedan whipped his scythe up and threw it, using the cable connected to its hilt to manipulate it from afar in unpredictable patterns to create even a tiny wound. Or he would have, if Sasuke's earlier attack hadn't cut the cable in over a dozen places. As it happened, the scythe flew about 10 feet before sticking in the ground well short of its target, no longer connected to Hedan. Well, this is just fucking embarrassing. Hold on a minute. Hedan went to retrieve his scythe, but Team 10 weren't about to let him just do as he pleased. Shadow possession success. Hedan stopped moving, staring in surprise at the shadow that connected his usual shadow to Shikamaru's, presumably holding him in place as well. Sora, now. The blue-haired Jinchuriki ran forward, claws radiating wind chakra. One slice was enough to sever Hedan's head cleanly from his body, which fell to the ground lifeless. Just like that, Team 10 had killed the first member of Akatsuki. Ow. Or not. That fucking hurt. Kakuzu. Get my body, I need to kill these bastards. Kakuzu. Hedon's severed head was still swearing as loudly as before, glaring at the boy who had chopped off his head. Team 10 had prepared as best they could, but nothing had prepared them for a man who simply couldn't be killed. Fuck it. I don't need him. Go on body, kill them all. Get them. Hedan continued shouting things to this effect, willing his body to get up and murder them all in increasingly sadistic and bloody ways. Team 10 stayed wary of the headless body, just in case its sis get up and start attacking them, but it became apparent that without a head, Hedan's body was as useless as any other headless body. Shikamaru was the first to recover from the shock of Hedan not being, dead. He might be alive, but I suppose he can't do anything but swear at us like that. A sudden explosion of debris from the wall saw Hedan joined by a tall creature made entirely of black threads that had burst through the wall in a flash of lightning. It enveloped Hedon's body, and a thread shot out to impale the silver-haired man's severed head. The thread retracted, much to Hedon's protest, until it too was absorbed into the mass of black. Team 10 and Eno tried to stop the thing, but whenever they got close, it fired off small bolts of lightning. After a few moments, the creature left as inexplicably as it had come, leaving Hedan with his head firmly attached to his neck by a new row of stitches. Hedan bent over to grab his scythe and raised it high. Jashin, you won't regret giving me a second chance to prove my devotion to you. 
I'll offer you these whelps as tribute to satisfy your undying thirst for life, if even for but a moment. Shikamaru's shadow struck out once more, but Hidan was ready this time, and deftly avoided it. The shadow continued to snake around, lifting off the ground entirely in some places to try and catch the Akatsuki member, but he was always one step ahead. As long as I keep one eye on your shadow, I won't be getting caught in the same trick twice. Yelled Hidan as the shadow missed him again. I think I'll slit your throats, and then hang you upside down from this wall. That'll let all the blood drain out. It'll be like a mural in Jashin's honor. Hidan left off the wall he was running up, leaping over the shadow below him. It tried to backtrack fast enough to catch the side-wielding crazy person, but it was simply too slow. Choji took it upon himself to defend his exhausted friend from Hidan. Expansion Technique Arms Choji's arms grew to gargantuan sizes, catching the easily telegraphed overhead swing of the scythe. One doesn't catch a weapon with that many blades and come away unscathed though, but it was only a small scratch really, hardly bigger than a paper cut. It still made Choji wince a little, and Hidan jumped back with a crazed look on his face. Shikamaru's shadow returned to him, and he began to gasp for air from the exertion of using his family technique for so long continuously. Ino knelt next to him, her hands enveloped in a green light to restore his chakra. Hidan landed in the blood from earlier, from both his lightning-style impalement and his decapitation minutes earlier. His feet moved in an intricate dance to form a bloody copy of his necklace's symbol large enough to stand in. Team 10 took the opportunity to let Shikamaru catch his breath, happy to let Hidan waste more time with his rituals if it meant they could be better prepared for his next attack. The symbol finished, Hidan raised his scythe slowly to his lips, giving the part that had cut Choji's hands a slow kiss. Oh Jashin, I initiate the ritual of you power with a kiss of death. I pray that you would give me your blessing to kill those who oppose you in a manner pleasing to you, prayed Hidan as his skin turned from a pale white to pitch black, save for the stylized white skeleton that covered his body. He lowered his head to Team 10, continuing his prayer, but obviously addressing them now. And I'll start by killing the fat ass. He's bound to be full of gallons of blood. You sick bastard. Scream Ino, throwing a kanai from her hand at the Akatsuki member, she was hoping he'd believe her to be emotionally compromised for real and dodge the knife, getting caught by Shikamaru's shadow once again though if he didn't the explosive tag around the handle would certainly slow him down. The knife impacted him squarely in the right thigh, but the scream of pain came from beside her instead. Ino looked to the side to see Choji gripping his right thigh in the exact spot the kanai had hit Hidan. She was too shocked to move for a minute, but quickly recovered and began to heal the inexplicable wound in Choji's leg. Until she heard the explosion of her kanai, and Choji's scream came once more as his wound somehow got much worse. She turned to the sound of Hidan's voice taunting her. Do you get it yet? Jashin's blessing is a curse on his enemies and followers alike. Any wound inflicted to one is reflected onto the other. But only those who have Jashin's favor live through it. I can't be killed as long as I serve Jashin faithfully. And Jashin demands sacrifices, like your tubby little friend. Hidan pulled out a collapsible spike from his Akatsuki cloak, and raised it dramatically above his head. I have to kill the rest of you too, so I'll end him quickly. Ino's light blue eyes widened in horror as she realized what Hidan planned to do. Shikamaru's shadow rushed out, but it was too late. The black spike came out of Hidan's back stained red, and Choji collapsed in a heap, gripping his chest. Fuck, that felt good. The ultimate pain, experienced together, that's what Jashin is all about, you know. So who's next? xxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxx
Sai sent a small flock of bird to intercept, but the water practically ignored the ink creations like they weren't even there. You are most, unyathful. Shouted Lee as if it were the worst insult he could think of. To take another's youth like that. I'll never forgive you. Sixth gate. Open. Lee's skin turned dark red, and veins along his face became extremely pronounced with all the extra chakra flowing through them. The ground below him buckled as he took off. Before Kakuzu could blink, a fist connected with his chest, and even through his earth spear technique, Kakuzu felt that hit. Fist followed fist, and before long, the friction caused by Lee's fists moving as fast as they were was enough to create miniature fireballs. Morning Peacock. It wasn't apparent to Kakuzu, but to anyone looking on at the technique, the flames did indeed fan out from the points of impact like the tail of a male peacock. All Kakuzu saw was pain and fire. The Akatsuki member was sent flying into the wall, covered in bruises and burns. If it hadn't have been for his earth style hardening his skin to the strength of diamonds, he would certainly have been dead, or at least out of the fight for good. Lee stood panting like he had just finished running a marathon, his skin returned to human hues. Tenton, now. Tenton nodded, and pulled a large scroll off of her back. She threw the large scroll, the paper trailing behind it in a large arc overhead. The writing on the scroll glowed white for a second before Tenton enacted her revenge for Neji. Manipulated tools, heavenly chain of destruction. The hundreds of weapons sealed into her scroll unsealed themselves then, emerging from the scroll so fast they appeared like white streaks of light. Many missed due to the large area the technique covered, and Sai and Lee were hard pressed to avoid betting cut to ribbons even though the technique wasn't aimed at them. Kakuzu was battered with assorted weapons, everything from average kunai to sanban to blades bigger than samahata. All were repelled by his hardened skin, and the weapons failed spectacularly at killing something as insubstantial as his thread creatures. Then the technique ended with four massive chains that could anchor a battleship launching downwards like arrows from the bow. Still coated in the chakra that had sealed them, the chains appeared as four spears of pure light that shot towards Kakuzu with deadly accuracy. The Earth Spear technique did have one drawback, speed. Unable to move quickly, Kakuzu was nailed by the chains, which then fell limply onto the practical floor of weapons. As the chains impacted, Kakuzu could swear he heard his skin crack from the hits. Kakuzu got up groggily, and his thread creature moved to his will. The alligator soared into his back, and the lightning heart returned from patching up Hidan to do the same. Thread fanned out of Kakuzu's back like the tail of a peacock, the two masks embedded in the black mass. His arms split at their seams, segmenting to increase their length. His hands shot out to either side to grab Tenton and Lee around their necks, choking them as he dragged them towards him. The leftover blades that littered the ground from Tenten's technique cut their skin as they were pulled across the ground. Tenten had the presence of mind to grab a katana as she was yanked past it and swing at the threads connecting the hand to Kakuzu. In as much pain as she was, coupled with the bad angle to attack from, her first swings missed by a mile. More thanks to luck than skill, she eventually cut the threads. More immediately re-established the connection, but the moment of weakness in Kakuzu's hand was enough for her to get away. Lee on the other hand, had no such luck, and was still being pulled along. Halfway to the Akatsuki member though, Sai dropped from the sky, slicing the threads with his tanto on the way past. Lee easily shook off the powerless bonds, and retreated to a safe distance. Well then, I was just going to take your hearts to compensate the losses you've dealt me, but I think I'll get my new hearts elsewhere. Said Kakuzu. Sometime during the commotion, he had lost his mask, revealing a mouth halfway stitched shut from both ends and a, tongue, made of the threads that inhabited his body. Earth style. Fish in a barrel. A circular wall rose up around the three-leaf ninja. They began to sprint up the sides, and Sai flew straight up on an ink hawk, but the wounds that they had suffered from being dragged over a field of swords were taking their toll. Blood came from their wound, and they were both forced to slow their pace. Suddenly Kakuzu appeared at the top, and both of his masks opened their mouths. Combination style. Electric typhoon. An electrified wave of water shot out of the masks, falling down on the two remaining members of Team 9. Fifth gate. Open. Lee's skin turned red, and he jumped horizontally off of the wall. He grabbed Tenton and shouldered his way through the wall she was running on. It was a high-level earth style, and Lee's body had already been pushed past the limit several times. 
Unable to take any more, he collapsed into blissful unconsciousness. Tenton checked Lee's body to make sure he was alive. She was surprised when a body landed next to them with a heavy thud. She looked over at Sai's body, then at the Akatsuki member who stood atop the hollow tower of stone he had created. The rock sank into the ground, and Kakuzu's threads retreated into his back. In his right hand was a bloody object, and a closer look at Sai discerned the gaping hole in his chest. Kakuzu had mentioned hearts before, and she had known that the thread creatures were extra hearts, but the horror of Kakuzu's technique had never quite set in until now. Your heart will make five again, said Kakuzu, as Sai's heart slipped in through a hole that opened up in his wrist. You've put up a good fight, but I survived a fight with the first Hokage before I even had this technique. You never stood a chance. Kakuzu's threads emerged from under his ski, writhing like snakes as Kakuzu stepped ever closer to Tenten. The only remaining leaf ninja could only stare in horror, paralyzed as Kakuzu approached. Her hand held a kanai, but she knew it wouldn't do any good, and let it fall to the ground. Lee chose that moment to let out a loud snore, and it actually stopped Kakuzu in his tracks. I only need one heart, and his is stronger. If you want to take his place, I'll have yours, but otherwise, I'll take his instead. Tenten's first thought was one of relief, she wasn't going to be this monster's next victim. That was quickly followed by a felling of horror, how could she think of betraying Lee like that? Any more emotion was stopped by Kakuzu's hand connecting with the base of her neck. It didn't kill her, but if she moved in the next week, Kakuzu would take Hidan out for dinner. Too long, girl. His thread reached over her and brought the green-clad Chunin up, several threads posed over his chest. Chapter 14. Chidori Sharp Spear. Sasuke's lightning style shot out and impaled the clay butterfly in a display of great accuracy as it descended on them. His Sharingan noticed the explosive chakra contained in the bomb drop but the concentration was simply too large to be negated by lightning-style jutsu alone. So Sasuke didn't bother thinking at all and acted on instinct. Fire style. Solar blade. Fire chakra flowed down his sword before he threw it at the small creature. He didn't bother to aim beyond throwing the sword in the general direction of the clay sculpture, and Sasuke's sword missed by a mile. Ha! You think I didn't know about my weakness to lightning style? C3 is designed to overcome that weakness with raw power, yeah. Shouted Didera. Sasuke and the others weren't listening, since Sasuke had tackled Hinata to the ground, and Shino had done the same with Kiba. Just then, the fire chakra contained in Sasuke's blade exploded outward without him to control it anymore. The orb of flames engulfed the butterfly, detonating it prematurely. The explosion almost reached them, but all Team 8 felt was a strong shockwave. What? Did you just, I'll turn you into art. Sasuke looked up at the mad bomber, and the gathering clouds behind her. Not ready yet, murmured Sasuke. His sword landed several feet away, melted to slag for all intents and purposes. He'd have to get a new one if he lived through this. Didera looked absolutely furious that her art had failed to eradicate the leaf ninja like it was supposed to. That was supposed to be a masterpiece that would send you to see the rest of your clan, yeah. Depriving my art of its purpose is something I can't forgive. Didera tossed a large amount of smaller bombs off the edge of her bird, opting to just carpet bomb the area below her. Sasuke decided to set the stage for his own masterpiece, realizing that it was likely the only way they were going to win. Even if he could win without it, the technique he had perfected with the Hawks would likely kill another member of Akatsuki. Not even Naruto would be able to shrug off Sasuke's coup de grace. Fire style, engulfing inferno. It was a basic fire style jutsu, despite the threatening name. It was actually meant to be the first fire style jutsu taught to beginners, which was why the Uchiha clan ignored it entirely and skipped right to the grand fireball. It produced a wave of flame barely hot enough to warm dinner, but it made a lot of fire, and it was enough to destabilize Didara's bombs, making them explode harmlessly in the air. Now. The hawk above Didera gave a large flap of its wings, launching blades of wine down on Didera. The Akatsuki member was unharmed, but her clay mount was damaged enough to trigger its self-destruction. Didera fell out of the smoke, frantically preparing more clay to keep her out of her opponent's reach. She wasn't quick enough though. Wolf Fang over Fang. A large two-headed wolf using the Fang over Fang was much more dangerous than Kiba and Akamaru separately. 
there was no possible way short of teleportation that Didera could evade an attack of this size from such close quarters. Not that Didera intended to dodge. Become art. Yeah. C2. A large dragon sprung forth from Didara's hands in a puff of smoke. It was quickly pulped by the large tornado, but the clay was enough to stop Kiba's attack. The wolf landed, far more gracefully than Didera, but was evidently stuck in a mangled mess of what had been the dragon. Boom. The clay encasing Kiba exploded violently, and for the first time this fight, Didera got to see her art do what it is supposed to do. Be beautiful and kill her enemies. She quickly began to prepare more while the sentimental leaf ninja mourned the loss of their mutt. Except for Sasuke, who was sprinting right at her with a handful of lightning. His chidori cut clean through her chest, blowing her heart to smithereens. Without the chakra to maintain the illusion, the clay clone returned to its regular white color and slumped around Sasuke's hand. It usually would have exploded, but unlike C3, Didara's regular clay clones didn't have the chakra required to ignore lightning-style jutsu. The real Didara's head emerged from underground some distance away. She jumped up onto a crane which was hopefully stronger than her hawk had been, and lacked the self-destruction of older models. She flew upwards, set on blowing that hawk summon to smithereens before focusing once more on the leaf ninja below. It wasn't like they could reach her. I'm going to skip the chakra eating. These parasitic insects carry a poison deadly even to me. Once they get under your skin, not even Tsunade could heal you. You'll die. Didera looked up to see Shino's bugs congregating in a massive sphere. Why you ask? Because you killed my friend. Shino stood below, his face contorted in one of his rarely seen emotions, rage. Secret technique. Beetle sphere. The purple orb of insects began to descend on Didera who quickly maneuvered out of the way on her clay bird. The beetles were nothing if not persistent, and while Didera was handily outrunning them now, she knew that if she let up for even a second she would be engulfed. She whirled around to throw some explosive clay at the bugs, but they simply absorbed the losses and continued their relentless pursuit. Didera hated to resort to such drastic measures, but she really wanted to stick it to these leaf ninja, and there's no kill like overkill. Didera pulled out a piece of clay, and grimaced before putting it in her mouth and chewing. Ironically, for someone whose entire lifestyle revolved around chewing clay, she hated the taste. She spit it out in an action more akin to throwing up than actually spitting, and the clay rose into the form of one of the most beautiful things in existence. The new bomb was a spitting image of Didera herself, enlarged several dozen times. Didera wiped the excess clay from her lower lip in disgust, and shouted out to the leaf ninja below. This is my ultimate art, yeah. You won't survive this one, even if it is scaled back so it doesn't kill my comrades. The large Didera bloated as if to burst while the real one retreated to a safe distance. She was glad to see the looks of terror in the faces of the leaf ninja as they watched the piece of art get ever closer to completion. She would have to something about the C4 making her look fat before it burst though. It was just downright unflattering. Shino's bugs stopped attacking to swarm around him defensively, making a tightly packed ball of beetles. Hanada dropped down into a defensive stance of the gentle fist, ready to use her protection of 64 palms at a moment's notice. Sasuke was putting his Sharingan to good use, using the jutsu he had copied from Didera to hide beneath the ground. Once the C4 had stretched as much as it could, making Didera rather frustrated at her chubby portrayal, it burst in a cloud of smoke. The lack of explosion was perplexing, especially given the hype Didara's C4 had received. Didara however, looked like a cat with a fish. She alone knew that this was only the first part of C4. Once she made the seal, the microscopic bombs scattered about by her lackluster first bomb would explode, decimating anything in their range on a cellular level. Sasuke's Sharingan noticed the air become heavily saturated in Didara's chakra, and noticed the Akatsuki member staying well away from the cloud of the stuff. He had no idea what it meant, but it wasn't good. Didera had likely found a way to make the very air explode or something. He body flickered over to Hinata and then pulled her along to the top of the wall, outside of the range of Didara's chakra. Sasuke, what are you aw? Hinata was unceremoniously cut off by Sasuke electrocuting her with a weaker version of the Chidori stream. He had already done it to himself to render the chakra he had inhaled useless, but his body was more accustomed to the electricity of the Chidori. 
Hinata's wasn't, and she collapsed into unconsciousness, though the explosives inside her were disabled. Sasuke jumped off the wall, intent of rescuing Shino as well. Oh no you don't, yeah. C4. Didera formed the seal, and just like that, it was over. Sasuke ran another Chidori through his system to clear out any of the chakra he inhaled on his way to Shino, but Shino had no such tactics, or even any idea what was going on. He could only stare in horror as first his bugs dissolved into dust, followed shortly by his own body. The method of explosion kept him alive for a few seconds of excruciating pain, then death. Ha! Two down, and two to go, yeah. Didera paused her condescending laughter when an explosion of downright malevolent chakra exploded from another section of Kakashi's walls. Well, there's our Jinchuriki, yeah. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
Without his cloak, Sora, Shikamaru, and Ino were given a clear view of the absurdly long cable that Hidan unwound from his left thigh, placing it alongside his other weapons. Hidan took off, aiming at Sora. His new speed was frightening, and made his previous attack speed seem like he had been moving through molasses. Despite losing two blades, his scythe packed a lot more kick than before as well, likely due to the decreased weight allowing Hidan to swing it faster. Sora could attest to the effectiveness, and before he realized it, Hidan was slamming him around like a dog with a chew toy. Thanks to the nine tails chakra covering him from head to toe, Sora managed to avoid getting cut, but the number and strength of the blows raining down on his hurt all the same. I'm only the slowest member of Akatsuki because I like my opponents to suffer the wrath of Jashin. But with your demonic chakra, I don't have to worry about killing you too soon. It's fucking wonderful. Hidan continued to shout things to this effect while he battered Sora. The Jinchuriki tried to strike back, but Hidan was able to easily knock the counter-attacks aside with his deadly scythe. Shikamaru got over his shock and tried to help his friend, and his shadow shot out towards Hidan as quickly as he could make it. Which wasn't fast enough. Hidan swung his scythe up to knock Sora upside the face, then let it continue on to dig into the ground behind him. He used the scythe as a pivot point to flip backwards as the shadow went straight through where he had been a second ago. Hidan landed deftly on his feet, and tugged the scythe out of the ground as he ran towards Shikamaru and Ino. Shikamaru retracted his shadow, but Hidan was coming at them faster than the shadow was, and Sora was still recovering from Hidan's barrage of attacks. The only reason Hidan didn't kill Shikamaru then and there was because of Ino. Clan Technique. Mind Transfer. Hidan had already seen her healing Shikamaru earlier, and dismissed her as a simple medic, but Ino was also a Yamanaka, and had deeply studied the mind, and her clan's techniques relating to it. Not expecting it, and caught running right into it to get at them as quickly as possible, Hidan was hit dead between the eyes with the mind-controlling technique. Hidan's body gave a rather uncharacteristic hop, and he clapped his heels together while he did it. I did it. Ino Yamanaka has saved you, you're welcome. If he had been more in control of his mind, Sora might have noticed that it was really Ino, not Hidan holding a scythe and wearing the tattered remains of an Akatsuki cloak. Unfortunately, Sora was little more of a condensed ball of rage directed solely at Hidan, a person Ino had the misfortune of currently being. Sora ran up behind her, and still unused to the body's controls, Ino was unable to react in time. Hidan's body was pounded into the ground like a nail and Ino's eyes rolled up into the back of her head. Now alone in his own mind, Hidan was free to curse once more. God damn it, that hurt. Hidan was cut off by Sora, who was far too enraged to stop with just one attack. He pounded Hidan on the head again, using both hands and dropping them with enough force to shatter the ground Hidan was trapped in. Hidan used the opportunity to escape, grabbing his scythe on the way out. Sora roared once more in rage, and Hidan smiled back. Sora ran at him on all fours, and struck out with his tails to close the gap faster. Hidan weaved around the tails as they impacted the ground around him, but wasn't agile enough to dodge Sora's fist. The blow connected squarely with Hidan's stomach, but the immortal simply grabbed hold of the limb and used it to flip Sora in an impressive display of strength. The burns left by the demonic chakra covering Sora like a second skin would have put most ninja out of the fight, but Hidan was just getting interested. So do you experience this pain all over your body like this? I might have misjudged you, said Hidan, honestly jealous of the amount of pain the Jinchuriki was likely experiencing. So I'll do you a favor and let you experience the most sublime pain in existence. Let's go together. Hidan's scythe began to glow blue as small blades of chakra formed to make the weapon appeared spiked along the edges. Blood tribute to Jashin, Chainslaughter. As if cued by his voice, the spike began to spin quickly, giving the whole scythe a coating of rotating chakra blades. Hidan and Sora rushed each other to the high-pitched whine of Hidan's chakra flow technique. They clashed, and both were too berserk to worry about dodging the other's attack. Hidan gained three parallel cuts deep into his chest from Sora's claws, and the Akatsuki member's most penetrating attack only scored a shallow cut through the demon chakra. The Jinchuriki's chakra coat quickly healed and covered the wound, but Hidan already had what he wanted. Sora was too far gone to the beast to notice the change, but Hidan's skin became black as pitch once more save for the skeletal markings on his exposed flesh. 
The Akatsuki member dodged several swipes from the Jinchuriki's chakra appendages, both tails and unnaturally elongated arms to make it back to the circle of blood he had prepared earlier. Shikamaru noticed the destination and left from attending to Ino to go on the offensive. His shadow acted for him, allowing the lazy Nara to take part in the battle of monster from a safe distance. Hidan was too focused on the Jinchuriki, and while he managed to make it into his circle, he was almost instantly trapped by Shikamaru's shadow. Fuck it all. I can't move, damn it. Hidan struggled against the technique, actually managing to wiggle a good millimeter or two in either direction. While he was still gritting his teeth to maintain the chakra output needed for the jutsu and the concentration to restrain someone as strong as Hidan, Shikamaru sighed in relief. As long as he could hold the Akatsuki member until the Jonin team could get here, they had won. No one else had to get hurt. Sora didn't care about the plan in his current state though. He only saw the person he was angry at standing still. He ran at the trapped Akatsuki member and swung at Hidan's face as hard as he could. There was an audible snap, like his neck had broken, but Hidan just straightened his head back like nothing had happened. Connected as they were, Sora's head snapped to the side as well, but the demonic chakra coursing through him healed the normally debilitating wound almost instantly. Fueled by uncomprehending rage, Sora continued to beat Hidan to a pulp, getting weaker with each hit as he damaged himself as well. Hidan stood there laughing in ecstasy with each hit. Shikamaru held the jutsu, knowing that if Hidan got any momentum, he would escape the shadow possession with ease. That didn't make it any easier to watch his friend hurting himself like this. Eventually, the pain became too much for even Sora's demonic stamina to take, and he collapsed to the ground. Two of his tails disappeared as he slipped in and out of consciousness, and the chakra became transparent, revealing the beaten Jinchuriki inside. Hidan continued to laugh maniacally, despite looking the same, if not worse. Is this all you can take, you little fucker? You'll never earn Jashin's favor like that. Once I can move Aga and we'll experience the ultimate pain together. Sora's current place on the ground offered a perfect view of the hole in the wall that Kakuzu's thread creature had broken through before into the area that Asuma and the others were fighting in. Sora was unable to muster the strength to move, even his head, and simply stared through the hole. A second later, his chakra exploded in a roar of pure fury. His chakra obscured his whole body, healing any wounds instantly. Hidan and Shikamaru looked on in surprise and horror at the nine red tails of chakra that casually swished through the air behind him. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
Kakashi, this isn't working, said Kuranai frantically. She had foregone physical combat, but chakra exhaustion was beginning to take its toll. We need something bigger. Kakashi nodded in agreement. I have just the thing. Guy, I'll need you to press the advantage. Don't hold back. The Sharingan user turned to face Naruto grimly. All the jutsu I've copied, let me show them to you. Multi-shadow clone technique. 30 copies of Kakashi appeared in puffs of smoke, each significantly weaker than the original. It was far less than the fabled 1000, but the number likely included some ridiculously idiotic jutsu and a great deal of hyperbole. Many jutsu were likely slightly changed with a brand new name slapped on. Naruto sensed the first jutsu coming a mile away, and jumped into the air to avoid the clone that tried to drag him into the earth from below. The shadow clones jumped away from their point of origin to surround Naruto. Water style. Water dragon. Fire style. Grand fireball. Wind style. Great devastation. Earth style. Stone edge. Lightning style. Bolt wave. Wind style. Tornado buster. Fire style. Hades drive. Lightning style. Hammer bolt. Water style. Grand maelstrom. Earth style. Earthquake booster. Fire style. Phantom Fire Shot. Water Style. Poseidon Wave. Wind Style. Tornado Wing. Lightning Style. Electro Web. Earth Style. Drill Run. Secret Taijutsu Technique of the Hidden Leaf. Thousand Years of Death. Water Style. Infinite Assault. Wind Style. Claw of the Storm. Water Style. Hydro Hydra. Fire Style. Inferno Claw. Earth Style. Avalanche Lance. Lightning Style. Hyper Shocker. Wind style, driver force. Earth style, terra blast. Lightning style, fusion bolt. Genjutsu, false trickery. Water style, hydro rush. Fire style, blazing beam. Rasengan. Wind style, zephyr shredder. Lightning style, lightning blade. The barrage of ninjutsu came all at once, engulfing Naruto in a flurry of death that was overkill by anyone's definition. Once they collided with Naruto midair, they more or less merged into a column of flames, lightning, and rock surrounded by steam. All the individual characteristics were lost to the wave of devastation chakras. The massive conflagration was cut clean in half by Kakashi's signature technique, leaving a streak of lightning chakra in a straight line through the Akatsuki member. It was a glancing blow, but Kakashi was impressed he had even hit Naruto when he was so obscured by the various jutsu. Guy, do it now! shouted Kakashi. Right. Guy crossed his arms for a moment, and then he lowered then suddenly as his chakra exploded. Seventh gate. Open. Guy's internal body temperature shot up as well, causing the green beast to sweat profusely from every inch of his body. In testament to how saturated his body was with chakra, his sweat practically glowed blue with excess chakra as it exited his body, and the sheer heat from his body caused it to evaporate immediately. The result was an intimidating blue flame that covered him entirely. Guy punched in Naruto's direction faster than anyone could see, even with the Sharingan, creating a truly massive amount of pressure. Then, even faster than the pressure, Guy placed his hands in front of it in a unique seal to shape the pressure as it passed through, directing it at the wounded Akatsuki member in the air. Evening Tiger. The seal imparted the shape of a tiger onto the pressure wave, hence the name. It slammed into Naruto, sending him flying high into the air before exploding violently. Did that do it? Asked Asuma warily, holding his useless right arm tenderly. Did we get him? Asuma's questions were answered when Naruto's body fell from the sky several meters away, creating a large crater upon impact. They looked on in shock as the blonde sage shakily got to his feet, wiping the blood away from his eye that came down from a wound on his head. His Akatsuki cloak was in tatters at this point, and he was barely any better. His left arm was clearly broken, and it was healing far slower than usual. He turned his scowl onto the two exhausted Jonin that had wounded him so. You will both die. But first I'm going to show you how outclassed you are. I'm still capable of taking you all on. Naruto punctuated his last sentence by grabbing the kunai headed towards his neck. Kurinai had though to catch him off guard while he was still wounded, but it was clear that wouldn't work. You'll be first then. Naruto flipped her over his shoulder, driving Kurinai into the ground. While she was still gasping in pain, he delivered a kick across her face. 
Naruto would never admit it, but he was weakened by the combination of ninjutsu and taijutsu that he had just been subjected to, and his kick lacked any killing potential. He raised his hand up, readying a punch that would kill Kurinai even if she was several feet below the ground. Kurinai. Asuma shouted with concern, running forward with his right arm listlessly trailing behind him. There was no way Asuma could make it in time to stop Naruto from killing Kurinai, and Kakashi was fighting to stay conscious after his ninjutsu barrage, a desperate ploy that had used a lot of chakra. That left guy, who in his current state, was of no help at all. Opening seven of the eight gate had torn almost every muscle in his entire body. Every breeze caused excruciating agony at the moment, and moving would feel a thousand times worse. Still, he was the only one who could save Kurinai, and he had to do what he had to do to stop Akatsuki. Naruto was hit before he could even sense Guy move, and he was even late hearing the sound of the technique that knocked him away from Kurinai. Gate of Death. Open. Guy stood, coated once more in the raw power of his chakra, and his muscles had bulged to ridiculous proportions. At the moment, his thigh was thicker than most people's torsos. Naruto had felt the blow through Sage Mode's protection, and it hurt. Guy spoke up again, and Naruto could only watch in awe. I won't allow you to harm my comrades any longer. If you insist on forsaking your youth, then I'll just take it from you. Guy, if you've opened all eight gates, Kakashi trailed off as his eternal rival offered a small smile in response. I know Kakashi. I've enjoyed our rivalry, but at least I'll go out in the prime of my youth, securing the youth of my pupils, said Guy, without his usual exuberance. I'm not over the hill yet, you know, mumbled Kakashi as he struggled to his feet, only to collapse back to his knees a second later. I know old friend, but leave this one to me. The premier taijutsu expert of the hidden leaf turned to face his target, and Naruto almost flinched from the oppressive feeling of Guy's anger. You'll be finished by the ultimate taijutsu technique. The Midnight Dragon. Naruto frantically began hand seals to end Guy before he could get close, but before he even finished the first one, his hand were stopped by Guy's right hand. The green beast's face contorted in rage as he tightened his grip, breaking Naruto's fingers, even through sage mode. Naruto didn't have time to dwell on the pain, since he immediately found Guy's fist buried in his gut. The blow was powerful enough to shatter the ribs of even a sage, and Naruto spit up a fair bit of blood from the blow. His mouth was snapped shut by a rising kick before Naruto even realized that Guy had let go of his hands. Naruto managed to open one eye as he flew up, and saw Guy far above him anyway. The dark, cloud-covered sky grew even darker in comparison to the bright light gathering around Guy's fist. If I don't, who will? Midnight Dragon. Guy streaked downwards, his fist wreathed in flames of both chakra and friction, shaped like the roaring head of a furious dragon. The shockwave of the punch hit first, driving Naruto into the ground with ten times the force of the afternoon tiger. The flaming punch landed next, breaking the ground around Naruto's landing spot into pieces so small they might have qualified as sand. Guy stumbled back from the impact site for a few steps as his skin returned to its normal shade and his muscles seemed to deflate. He collapsed to the ground face first, dead. It was testament to his strength that his body was even intact, as the recoil damage from the midnight dragon was usually enough to vaporize even the user. Even so, Guy had escaped with all but his right arm intact. The three living Jonin were simply stunned by the display of power that rivaled tailed beasts, likely dwarfing the weaker ones. Guy was a legendary ninja, who would have tale of his strength spread for centuries. The leaf ninja were just beginning to realize that despite losing Guy, they had managed to kill an Akatsuki member when it happened. Just as they were about to leave and go help other teams fight Akatsuki, or more likely quit while they were ahead, a long tongue came flying out of the impact site, heading straight for Kurinai. She was too stunned from earlier to dodge, and Kakashi was still half dead from his massive attack spree to help. Asuma however, reacted in time, unceremoniously shoving her out to the ground. The fighting tongue slash impaled the third Hokage's son through the chest, piercing his heart and killing him instantly. Kakashi and Kurinai followed the tongue, which retracted back to the source, to Naruto. The young Akatsuki member was lying on his back in a pool of his own blood, facing the leaf Jonin with a look of pure hate on his face. Kakashi's hand lit up with a chidori to finish what his eternal rival had started, when a massive explosion of demonic chakra rocked the area. 
The walls separating them had finally had enough, and they collapsed to reveal Sora, clad in the nine tails chakra with nine red tails behind him. Naruto didn't see it, since his wounds had finally taken their toll and he collapsed into unconsciousness. Didera looked down from her clay beast to see her partner in more dire straits than she had ever seen him in, and entered a quick dive to get him. Distracted as they were by the tailed beast's escape from the seal, no one but Sasuke noticed her clay pelican swallow Naruto. The Uchiha in question followed her escape from the scene on his hawk, cutting her off. I won't let you two leave here alive, he threatened, obviously tired, but obviously determined. What are you going to do, yeah? I've seen you using big jutsu this whole time, you must be running on empty right about now, countered Didera, reading Sasuke's body language rather well. I might be almost out of chakra, but I still have enough left for my trump card. Sasuke's hand began to crackle with lightning, and Didera became acutely aware of the storm clouds they were very close to. I wanted to show this to Naruto. A jutsu that harnesses the power of nature itself. The hawks didn't have the secret to Sage Mo, but they did help me perfect this. This technique will guide the lightning trapped in these clouds down on your head faster than you can blink. This jutsu's name, is Kirin. The lightning in Sasuke's hand shot up into the sky, and the lightning behind him took the form of a massive dragon, silhouetting the youngest Uchiha against it. Wait! shouted Didera frantically. You can kill us, but there are still eight other members of Akatsuki. But if you let your Jinchuriki friend keep rampaging down there, he'll kill all your friends from the village, yeah. Sasuke couldn't deny her logic, looking down at his allies frantically trying to fight both the Akatsuki members and the indiscriminate Jinchuriki. Your jutsu might be able to stop a rampaging Jinchuriki, yeah. Us, or your friends. We're leaving now anyway, and Hidan and Kakuzu have no reason to stick around. Sasuke only had a second before he lost hold on his ace in the hole. Vanish in the thunder, Kirin. Sasuke's hand came down like a judge's gavel declaring a guilty verdict, and the dragon of lightning flew back into the heavens. Then it came crashing down in an instant. In a flash of light, the battlefield had been rearranged into a pile of rubble, but only the target had been actually hit with Sasuke's most powerful jutsu. Lying in the deepest part of the crater, lay Sora. The Jinchuriki that had been in an inconsolable fury moments before was now devoid of any demonic chakra, which had all retreated into his seal to focus on healing the wounds inflicted by the Kirin. Didera looked pleased and relieved at the same time, letting out a breath she didn't know she was holding. Sasuke was kneeling on his hawk, entirely out of chakra after his ace had been used. Tears of blood slid down his face, and when he opened his eyes, the Sharingan had changed pattern to three overlapping red ovals outlined in black on a black background. Those eyes, just like Itachi, Didera looked on in awe at the newly awakened Mangekio Sharingan before regaining some composure. In one month, come to the closest Uchiha hideout alone. Itachi will be waiting there for you. Itachi's challenge was issued not a moment too soon, as Sasuke collapsed onto his hawk in exhaustion, though the hawk had the decency to lower him to the ground before going home. Didera allowed herself a smirk. She had felt the attacks Naruto had taken to put him in such bad shape, and they wouldn't be in vain. One of her earth clones burst from the ground, grabbed the unconscious Jinchuriki and hopped on a clay hawk in a matter of seconds. Didera had hid the clone with the sculpture before the fight had began, just in case of such an eventuality. Though she never imagined Naruto getting this messed up, she put as much distance between herself and the leaf ninja as possible, both to secure the Jinchuriki and get her partner some medical attention. The surviving leaf ninja below could only mourn their losses. I'm perfectly aware of why there are two corpses over my shoulders, but they difficult to get out of there. Why did you bother to drag this corpse along with you? Asked Kakuzu, gesturing to his partner with his elbow. I promised Jashin I would butcher this fat ass, and I intend to keep that promise. Trust me, it's a pain in my ass too, retorted Hidan. He hefted Choji's body to ease the pain on his wrist afterwards. He just did not know how Kakuzu made it look so easy. Then again, his bodies weren't as large. At least you aren't mutilating any money. 
What happened to the Jinchuriki you were fighting? Asked Kakuzu. The bounty hunter honestly didn't see what had happened to the Nine Tails. He was far too busy getting his own targets. He would have liked to get Kakashi too, but he would settle for Asuma Serutobi and Might Guy. Fuck if I know. One second he was going all crazy, and then there was that giant lightning bolt, and poof. No more tailed beast. Summarized Hidan, complete with one-handed gestures to emphasize his point. We have another one. Kakuzu simply grunted as Pain's voice came through their rings, but Hidan wouldn't be content unless he had something to whine about. We fucking know that already, we were there Jashin damn it, grumbled the silver-haired immortal. He looked around the clearing they were situated in, and fell to the ground. This place is as good as any. Let's get this ceiling over with. For once, Kakuzu was in agreement with his partner, and he leaned his bounties up against a nearby tree. So what required me to, get your body? Asked Kakuzu. Ah, the fucking Jinchuriki had some crazy sharp claws, sliced my head clean off, replied Hidan nonchalantly. What about you, huh? Have any trouble with your little shits? I lost two hearts, but I got some decent replacements. I'll need to pick up a new mask to cover the second one though. We'll need to get you a new cloak as well, said Kakuzu, gesturing to the cloak that Hidan was wearing at the moment, little more than a partial web of black threads. Huh, guess we will, mused Hidan. A nasty grin spread across his face as a way to annoy his partner. Hey Kakuzu, how much do you think those cloaks cost? They're pretty durable, must cost a small fortune apiece. Hidan's grin only grew as he saw Kakuzu's face contort with the idea of wasting money. Maybe I could fight naked to save you some cash, huh? Kakuzu's eyes snapped open immediately, and he turned to face his partner. You will be getting a new cloak at the next possible opportunity. I will pay for it myself if you don't have the cash. Hidan was slightly taken aback at the out-of-character gesture, and then burst out laughing. He had finally found something Kakuzu would part with money for. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
and Hanada can tell you what happened the last time we tried negotiating with the Hidden Cloud Village. It isn't common knowledge, but the third Mizukage once tried to release the three tails in the Leaf Village to destroy it, and killed one of the fourth Hokage's students in the process. The only village we could ask for help we already have. And other than Gara, the Hidden Sand doesn't have the forces needed to fight evenly with Akatsuki without crippling their own village. Kakashi's right, I'm afraid, said Kurinai gravely. The cycles of war has removed any chance of cooperation between the great villages. Then we turn to the minor villages, suggested Sasuke. If there are nine-tailed beasts, then all the villages would have two except for one. But both the Hidden Leaf and the Hidden Sand only had one. Either one village has three, or a minor village somewhere has a Jinchuriki. We need to help protect them. Kakashi's eye widened as he realized what Sasuke was saying. True. The hidden waterfall was given a tailed beast by the first Hokage. Supposedly, he felt they would become strong enough to threaten the peace he had crafted after an assassin from the village tried to kill him. They disowned the assassin to avoid a war, but they still got a tailed beast. We've never been to war with them, so they might be willing to help us. I know it's a long shot, but we can't let Akatsuki just take what they want, said Sasuke angrily. We need to at least fight for the world we have. Still, this isn't for us to decide, said Kakashi. I'll suggest it to Lady Tsunade though when we arrive at home. Let's go. Sasuke smiled to himself sadly. He was glad that his ideas had been passed on. It was very likely he wouldn't be alive in a month but he would try his hardest to live though this destined battle against the man who had killed his family. Kiyoya and Ginji were rather shady individuals. The two actually did operate a legitimate bank on the southeastern edge of the Land of Fire, but their real profit came from the fee they got for managing the fund of an even more unscrupulous individual named Kakuzu. It was only a fraction of a percent of his total finances per year, but the, tiny, amount was enough to make them two incredibly rich people by normal standards. Should we have red wine or white wine with dinner tonight? Asked Ginji. His partner in crime thought about it for a moment before replying. Dare I say it, both. Kiyoya grinned wildly at his suggestion. He was incredibly proud of their ill-gotten fortune and willing to flaunt it at any given opportunity. Not that Ginji didn't. Shall I send for it, old friend? Why not? Replied Ginji. He leaned over to hit the intercom and send his assistant out for a rather lavish dinner. Just as he was about to hit the button, his assistant burst into the room. I'm sorry sir, I told her we're closed right now but she just barged right in and, she stammered out. Ginji was a tad annoyed. Then he saw who was behind his assistant. Actually, it's okay. This is an old friend. We'll talk in the back. You know what, take the rest of the day off, he said, staring wide-eyed at the lady standing in his doorway. His assistant was a bit surprised at her good luck, but she wasn't paid to ask questions. Ginji turned to the person he hoped might double their profits. And how can we help you? You are an acquaintance of Mr. Kakuzu, yes. Zip it. I don't care about money, yeah. She deadpanned. You know people in my line of work. Darker people. Plus, you were the only Akatsuki contacts close enough. Slightly deflated at the prospect of a new account closing before it could open, Kiyoya and Ginji still weren't stupid enough to bite the hand that fed, clothed, and housed them. What can we do for you madam? Said Kiyoya eloquently all signs of his true unprofessional self gone in the blink of an eye. I need to find a guy named Orochimaru. He's the only guy the first can trust for this job, and I need to find him quickly. If you can't help, I'll turn you into pieces of art. Shitty art, threatened Didera. W we don't know exactly where he is, started Ginji, only to quickly finish his sentence when Didera reached under her Akatsuki cloak for some clay. H he's always moving around, I swear. B but he has a hideout near here. I can mark it on a map if you'd like. Didera thrust out a map, and Ginji shakily marked the area of Orochimaru's hideouts on the map. This can't be right, that's the middle of the ocean, observed Didera skeptically. It's an island prison for his experiments. We've never done much business with the man, so we only know the location of the one, I swear, informed Kiyoya. 
Didera took the map and stormed out of the building, running as fast as she could back to the clay hawk where she had left Naruto. Whatever those leaf ninja did had really done a number on her partner, and his wounds weren't healing nearly as fast as they usually did, and Akatsuki didn't have a full-time medic on hand. Orochimaru was said to perform experiments on the human body, mutating it in strange ways, but he was the closest thing to a medic she knew of. She was desperate to get her partner the help he need, and this was all she could think of. Why did we ever get involved with those monsters? Asked Ginji, almost sadly. Kiyoya simply grinned and held up a wad of bills, none of them small. The reminder brought a smile to Ginji's face, and the corrupt banker sighed. That's why, of course. Thanks for reminding me. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
This is one of three surviving parasites that were specifically raised to infuse the user's chakra into any material and allow the user to control them remotely. There aren't any left in this world, and all knowledge of how to produce them is a forbidden technique of the hidden rock that I destroyed years ago. Is this good enough to get my partner healed? Didera held back gasps of pain as the burning pain in her left arm got even worse. Her arm had retreated into her Akatsuki cloak, where she clenched it tightly to keep the bleeding to a minimum. Kukuku. Orochimaru laughed as he plucked the parasite out of Didara's hand and placed it in a small tank, which he slid into wherever he had been storing the glass container before. Of course. This will be a great help. Karen, heal our guest, will you? And record the results. I don't recall you ever healing a comatose patient, so it'll be an experiment for all of us. Orochimaru's order snapped Karen out of her shock, and she nodded vigorously. Of course, Lord Orochimaru. Karen walked up to the comatose blonde on the floor as if he might get up and attack her at any moment. Though the conscious blonde was the one who would likely kill Karen if there were any suspicious moves. Her nervousness was likely due to this person's chakra though. She hadn't noticed it before because he had been surrounded by his partner's volatile chakra, but his own was almost identical to a ambient chakra in the area, and was absolutely massive, even while he was supposedly comatose. He was however a bit bigger than her, and she struggled to carry him to the infirmary, though that might have been a rather generous term for the scientific laboratory where all the medical equipment was. There was always the heel bite if conventional tactics failed, so Karen wasn't too worried about her new patient not making it. I'll be back for him in three days, said Didera. If there's anything different about him because of you, I'll show you why I'm an S-ranked ninja of Akatsuki who defeated the case cage of the hidden sand in single combat. To his credit, Didera might have offered Orochimaru a suggestion for dinner for all he reacted. I, assure you, my experiment here will be observation only. I won't even use any experimental medical techniques on him, unless I have to. Didera left the base in a hurry. As much as she wanted to stay by Naruto's side and make sure that Snake Freak kept his hands to himself, she needed to find somewhere to hole up during the ceiling. They had managed to get the Nine Tails after all. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
share and subscribe for the next video as it's going to be more interesting and also check out my other playlists hope you would like them too.